All right, we'll get started. Um, as folks know, this is a meeting that will be recorded. We are holding this meeting virtually again because of relief that Governor Baker provided over a year ago now in light of the pandemic uh, through an executive order that lets public bodies like ours meet virtually. Uh, today is April 8th. It is a gorgeous day. So I hope everyone gets a chance to do a, um, some kind of a walk or a run or something that gets you outside. It is public meeting number 341. And for at least two of us, that is particularly significant and it's becoming pretty significant to the other two at this point as well. So here we are. Um, I guess we'll move right into the minutes. Commissioner O'Brien, good morning. Good morning. I don't know, Chair, if you wanted to take a roll call before oh, we get started. Thank you for the reminder. You're good at, to remind me. Um, of course, because we're meeting virtually, I do need to confirm our attendance. Commissioner Cameron. Good morning, everyone. I am here. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I am here. Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning. I am here. Okay. And I'm here. So all four of us are here. And I hope, Commissioner Cameron, you had a little bit of a nice break. Um, we missed you last week. I did, thank you. It was uh, nice to be away for a couple of days. Was golf involved? Of course. Of good course. to know. Then we know you had some good fun. All right, now we'll get started with the minutes. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, I move that the Commission approve the meeting minutes from um, February 17th, 2021, subject to um, a, the insertion of the timestamps on the agenda topics. Todd Grossman and I have already spoken about this. They're going to be doing that. Um, and other than that, um, subject to correction for any graphical error or ministerial error. Any questions, comments, edits requested? Just All a right. second. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. And or Madam zero, Chair, Vivian. Thanks. As to the second set of minutes from February 25th, it's the same. Um, they're inserting the timestamp in terms of the agenda topics. Aside from that, I would move that the commission approve the minutes from February 25th, 2021, subject to corrections for any typographical error or other non-material matter. I have one friendly edit and it is not technical, it's simply technical, more around spirit. The, on the beginning of page two, where it, um, the very the first paragraph, it says at the last sentence, Chair Judstein explained that the minutes were not sufficiently detailed. Uh, our minutes are always so detailed. I didn't want that to be reflected in the minutes. I think what had happened in that particular batch was that the minutes were detailed around our, our team's reports, but were, were um, less detailed around the commissioner's reports. So, right. so, yeah, so if we could just say um, we're, we're um, less, uh, just needed to further detail the commissioner's comments, that would be great. Certainly. Thanks. Any other comments or edits? Great I'll job. Second. Okay, great job as always. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four zero. Vivian, thanks so much. So we're gonna move on then to item number three, Executive Director Wells in our administrative update. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, as we've been doing uh, over the last almost year now, uh, I think the uh, item 3A is the on-site casino update. So I'll turn that over to Director Lilios and Assistant Director Ban to give you an update on what's going on on the properties. Thanks. Hi, Karen. Thank you. And good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. So um, I wanted to report to you consistent, as Karen said, with the reporting we've been giving around COVID-related health and safety measures that the licensees are continuing to abide by the heightened measures the commission adopted back in June. Uh, those measures are around the cleaning, the sanitization, the continued focus on the high touch areas, monitoring for crowding, signage, uh, 
availability of hand sanitizer throughout floor markings at queuing areas for distancing purposes and ensuring uh, the, uh, that the mask mandate is adhered to uh, by uh, both patrons and staff. Um, the licensees have maintained their staffing levels um, and continue to uh, give resources to let them comply with with all of these requirements. And this includes for MGM and Encore measures around their hotels as, as well to make sure that hotel guests are not using the hotel properties in a way that uh, puts people in danger. Uh, the IEB through our agents and through continued communication with the licensees are continuing to find a high uh, degree of compliance uh, with these measures. And in terms of patrons as well, they generally are uh, knowing by this time what to expect. I don't have any significant incidents to report to you. Uh, Bruce has been providing you with updates on capacity and operations, uh, and I can ask him to jump in and let you know what's been happening uh, for the past couple weeks. And then of course, we'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you have. Great. I mean, uh, go. Good morning, Bruce. Bruce. And the four seat continues to go pretty well. MGM still hasn't started crafts. They've had uh, a couple of technical difficulties. Uh, uh, the only thing they still have to do is to uh, get their camera coverage uh, down on the crafts tables. And I imagine they'll be ready by this weekend. They had a few tweaks still left to do. As far as uh, occupancy goes, uh, PPC's uh, high day was on March 27th with 1,434 people, which represents 25% capacity. And that was, uh, they had a sweepstakes going on that night uh, for uh, uh, MGM. Their high day was on 327 as well. And that was 1,944, which represents 25% as well. They had a car giveaway. That seems to be their big nights uh, when they have uh, the highest capacity. Encore's highest was uh, March 27th as well when they had a uh, slot uh, play uh, promotion. And their uh, high number was 3,664, which represents 22% capacity. Other than that, there wasn't any real high numbers uh, uh, in you know, any of the casinos or anything like that, everything seems to be going rather smoothly. Thank you, Bruce. Questions for Loretta or Bruce? All, all positive news. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm just curious, how popular is um, the craft back at EBH? Uh, it, it seems to be going real, real well. They, there don't seem to be a crowding problem around it. They're doing a real good job with it. Uh, people are learning how to throw dice underneath that uh, that container. That is a little bit of a learning curve for people. But other than that, we really haven't had any uh, problems with it at all. Okay, great, thanks. Great. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda I'm looking forward to is uh, an update from our financial investigations team led by our supervisor, Monica Chang. So similar to what the gaming agents did for you last uh, public meeting, you know, they're going to give you an overview of what they do and sort of a, a robust look at sort of the daily life of the, of the financial investigator and an overview of that division. So I'm going to turn it over to Monica to give you uh, their presentation today. Great. Good morning, Thank Monica. You, Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners and everyone. Um, happy to present to you today. So let me just uh, share my screen and get going. How is that? That's Excellent. good. Okay, great. Um, so uh, again, happy to be here today and to take you through a high level look into the financial investigations team within the IEB. Uh, but before we dive into the details of that team, I want to briefly just uh, start with the IEB investigations team and its core function. 
The team is made up of both members of the Mass State Police and financial investigators who completes law enforcement checks and ongoing suitability evaluations on casinos, vendors, and employees of the gaming establishments. Uh, this is done to ensure that people and business entities involved with gaming meet the high standards of integrity, honesty, and good character. So for the specifics of the financial investigations team, uh, to start off, the team is made up of six professionals, including myself. Uh, the group is split into three main levels, one through three, and each carry out uh, specific types of investigations. Uh, the team's background and experience include tax, both on the audit and tax preparation sides, uh, accounting and audit, and also financial reporting and analysis. So the team is really uh, an interdisciplinary team because of the different backgrounds and experience that we have, and that is one of our core strengths. So we take on a collaborative approach, and with our different skills, we can think very critically together, and we oftentimes have uh, brainstorming sessions together. Uh, our work sometimes is reviewed by each other to make sure that our investigatory approaches are applied consistently, but also that they address the risks that are applicable for each type of investigation. So uh, since the tax accounting audit and finance will change quite frequently, the team also has to uh, aim to stay on top of the industry news. We dedicate time to learn new concepts and adjust our investigations appropriately. Uh, for example, the team had to study some of the details of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was enacted at the end of 2017. So that affected the 2018 tax returns, but also the questions of uh, what, what, quite, what type of questions that we ask our applicants. So that's just, that's just one of the examples. And on top of domestic industry changes, the team also has to be mindful of foreign rules because we do perform investigations of vendors and individuals from outside of the US. One of our uh, main investigatory responsibility is to review, validate, and analyze information to determine financial stability, integrity, and background. This means that we have to examine both personal and business financial records to determine the source and also adequacy of funds. Um, aside from those, uh, we also have a monitoring function for our casino operators and vendors for ongoing suitability. Now there are uh, different types or level of investigations that the team does and I've separated them into two main groupings, uh, individuals and entities. So for the individuals on the left, uh, we have our casino qualifying individuals, our key employees, junket representatives, and vendor qualifying individuals. So the commissioners, um, you're familiar with the first one, which is uh, which are the qualifying casino persons. And uh, the most recent ones that came before you for approval were uh, Arnell Strong from Wynn Resorts and uh, John B. Newman from MGM. So one thing that I wanted to highlight is that the financial investigations team perform the review of applicants who have uh, either super advisory functions at the properties who are executive management teams, or they have uh, directorship, direct directorship positions. The employees who are considered to be non-key gaming employees or service level employees uh, that work at the properties, they don't undergo this financial background review. Um, so then the other grouping is the entities, which includes our casinos, uh, our primary and secondary gaming vendors. So our primary gaming vendors are those companies that offer the goods and services directly related to gaming. So uh, for example, the slot machine manufacturers like Interblock, Aristocrat, IGT, those would be the primary gaming vendors. The secondary vendors are, are companies that offer the services and goods that don't relate directly to gaming, like construction or food and beverage. So here I listed some of the financial documents that are looked at by the financial team. Uh, between the personal and business documents, they're, they're quite similar. We look at bank statements, real estate documents, uh, annual reports, financial statements, public filings. Uh, we also have uh, looked at loan agreements, credit reports, tax returns. Um, 
And sometimes the investigatory reports from other gaming jurisdictions are reviewed by the team as well. Uh, some of these documents are uh, public, but some are private, sensitive, confidential information that the applicants submit to us. So the team does have security protocols and procedures that are in place to safeguard that information. And obviously that's not done without the help of our uh, MGC ITS team. So if you wondered about the process of an investigation, uh, I put up here a flow chart of what that looks like. Um, it starts with the application documents that the applicants fill out, which has a wealth of information already because it does include attachments that they have to submit. Uh, after the application review, then we move into sort of the kickoff stage uh, where both the state police and financial investigators come together and uh, formally kick off the investigation. Uh, timeline and logistics are also discussed during the stage on top of uh, talking out and figuring out what types of questions and additional documents that we should request from our applicants. After that, we go into the investigation and analysis stage uh, where the bulk of the document review takes place. So after gathering all of the information, either through public or private means, this is the stage where we process that information um, so not all investigations are created equal, so the team adopts uh, a risk-based approach. And, and that just means that sometimes we might ask more questions or we might ask for more docu uh, backup documents or interview more people. So it all really depends on the complexity of the cases and uh, what the risks are. So uh, when the bulk of the analysis is complete, investigators move forward with the site visits and in-person interviews. Uh, finally, everything is put together that ultimately becomes the IEB investigations report. So at the last uh, final report stage, that's when uh, everything is drafted and reviewed, either through secondary supervisory review or even third level review. Um, so as I mentioned briefly before, the financial investigations team, we have to have knowledge of foreign rules and regulations because we have applicants who are not U.S. citizens, they don't reside in the U.S. or don't have businesses that are set up in the U.S. Um, so through independent research and sometimes guidance from our applicants, we gain proficiencies in interpreting these foreign regulations and processes. We have to do this because we want to be able to identify the high-risk areas and then adjust our investigations appropriately. So on this slide here uh, is just a listing of the 15 different countries that the team has come across in our investigations. Uh, these uh, type, uh, foreign accounts, which tax returns, documents were all looked at by the team at one point. Uh, we've learned how to interpret the documents for each one of them. And this is a valuable skill because like once you've gone through it, you, you don't forget because most likely you will come back through the renewal process or you can simply just apply what you've learned to another investigation. So since the pandemic um, and the team has been teleworking, uh, the financial investigations team just has not slowed down. Uh, we have continued conducting our investigations. Uh, one of the changes though uh, was switching from doing the in-person interviews to holding the interviews virtually through some of the platforms here that I've listed out. Um, and of course, on top of that, we have suspended travel uh, to do the corporate site visits. Uh, but as restrictions lift around the globe, the investigations team would uh, be able to resume those vendor site visits again, um, obviously taking into consideration the, the health and safety of everyone involved before um, jumping into that. So uh, besides those two changes, the team also has used uh, WeConnect to communicate with our applicants instead of using our desk phones, um, obviously because we're not uh, in the office. And lastly, we use the, uh, the secure file transfer site for receiving and exchanging sensitive and confidential information. So this is a new site that replaced uh, the old interchange that we were using before. So on top of doing the investigations, the team has accomplished quite a few other things during the year, including assisting with the casino statutory audits. Uh, we've completed the PPC renewal. 
Uh, we've also created the casino uh, monitoring program. Uh, during this time, we've also worked very closely and more closely with the different divisions within the IED. And one of our team members is uh, also a part of the equity and inclusion working group that, that you, the chair, has initiated. And last but not least, the team has hosted different training for the group in obviously the areas of tax, accounting, and audit, but also uh, branching out into uh, SEC filings, uh, corporate structure, trust, and junkets. Question? Oh. oh this is my more. favorite slide, Monica, my <laughs> favorite slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so at the end of the day, who are we? Um, the financial investigation team are accountants, we are tax accountants, financial <laughs> analysts, we're auditors. Um, uh, Susan LaRosa, La Paul Eldridge, uh, David McKay, John Fejo, and Matt Jordan, they make up our investigation team. Uh, they work very hard and they've been maintained the same high level of professionalism, integrity, and work ethic in the last year and this team just uh, would not be successful without uh, each and every one of them. And oftentimes they really have to take like the technical uh, financial information given to them and they'll have to present them in ways that our non-financial audit audience can digest and understand. So being able to do that is really uh, something to be proud of. So on this slide here, I really like the definition of the accountant. <laughs> Uh, someone who, who solves a problem you didn't know you had in a way you don't understand. <laughs> and um, I'm pretty confident to say that uh, the team relates to this. But on top of being wizards and magicians, uh, the team is a group of professionals who like working with numbers and uh, we like to decipher the meaning of behind those numbers. So, so that wraps up my presentation. Um, thank you, I can take this off and I welcome any questions that the commissioners have. Commissioners, Commissioner Cameron. Yes, uh, first of all, Monica, excellent presentation. I loved reading it and I like it even better uh, with you really putting the detail behind the words on the PowerPoint. A couple of things uh, stood out to me. One, uh, your interdisciplinary approach. It's just not always done that way. I mean, the collaboration, and I see it, and I understand it, it's not, it's real, meaning how well you work with the state police investigators. You know, you mentioned the peer review, the brainstorming, that's such a critical piece of any investigation, and to watch our team do this seamlessly is, uh, it, it makes me proud. I'll give you one example, Monica, and I don't know, and I, I'm remiss if I didn't share this story with you earlier. I know I did with the, um, the, the head of uh, IED. I know Karen's heard the story. This was a couple of years ago, but it's, it's relevant. Um, I'm at a conference and a woman seeks me out um, and said, I saw your name on the roster, a gaming conference, and I wanted to find you. And I introduced, we introduced ourselves. She was in charge of um, kind of, uh, this is one of our licensees that has, deals with, you know, 28 different states, you know, so it, it was an MGM person who sought me out to say, look, I just wanted to tell you how much easier your team makes my job because it was her job to get all the qualifiers ready in every state for these investigations. And I said, really? And she said, they are so professional, both your financial as well as your state police investigators. And I asked her for an example and she gave me two. The first was how accessible the team is for questions. You know. Somebody may be doing this for the first time and there's a lot of paperwork, right? The forms are somewhat detailed and how excellent our team is at answering those questions. And second was how prepared our team is in the actual interview. These are very busy people, right? Lots of them are at the top of their profession and there weren't questions that were fully detailed in the application. It was so apparent that our financial folks and our state police investigators had read everything thoroughly and their questions were totally on point which saved a lot of time in the interview so um i just appreciated so much hearing that about our team from someone who just sought me out and um and i just wanted to pass please pass that along to your team that the work you do is recognized and uh, and you represent us so well as a member of this commission so thank you and thanks to the whole team 
Excellent. Excellent. Um, Commissioner Zunica or Commissioner O'Brien? Commissioner Zunica? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Monica. Um, uh, it's a great presentation, and um, uh, Gail summarized uh, a story that I, heard I had heard before, but is uh, emblematic on all the great work that you do. Um, one thing that um, uh, has occurred to me um, as we have moved into the SharePoint, uh, you know, revamping our share drive, um, one thing that I think might be really helpful for um, uh, commissioners. Um, especially new ones, is to be thinking about um, a place where we, where, where the final reports could reside for us to take a look at, you know, on an exception basis as we, as we might want to. Um, we delegated, and that was, I think, appropriate, the decision for licensing to the IB director and, and et cetera on, on a number of things. We still review the qualifiers, but the vendors we don't see. And access to those reports um, would be, I think, very, very important. I don't mean the work papers. I don't mean anything confidential. I don't mean especially anything in process, uh, because I know we, we remain, there, there's, there's um, a necessary distance from that process. But when the final report is issued uh, and, and we keep for our records, as I know you are very diligent in keeping, access to those would be, in my opinion, very important. Um, for commissioners to come in and, and see from time to time, or you know, they could be um, you could you could proactively say, uh, you know, here's here's an important you know final report that you might want to take a look at or not. Um, but um, that's not to say that they're not available. I have gotten them uh, upon request. But yeah. again, um, as we as we um, continue to improve our, our our transition into a shared environment of a a share drive uh, in with SharePoint, um, and 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 all of that is with the with the appropriate protocols for access, and uh, um, I, I think it will be really so, important. Com for us commissioner, to look at that. commissioner, in fact, you're, this is really helpful and helpful to have it and repeat in in this forum um, because um, I have been uh, dis have been in discussions with both Karen, Commissioner O'Brien, and and um, <clears throat> Director Lilios about a, a tracking system on so that we can know what's underway and what's completed. And if it's a if it's a database, that, I'm not sure if it's SharePoint. Uh, you know what it looks like if it's Excel, um, but that we could clearly have the final reports in read only. We don't want to mess up their system, but read only, and it would help us um, start to really get a collective feel for the, the body of work that the IEB and the investigations do. So we are thinking about that in the SharePoint, um, really I think we're gonna have to tap Katrina's team um, as, as if they don't have enough on their, on their plate anyway. But um, Loretta's aware of um, you know, this, this sort of ongoing request. Loretta, I think it just shows that the, the commissioners are looking because you are now really building up a body of work. And so to Monica's credit, um, all of your good work, we, we now want to be able to reflect on it. So thank you. That's that's helpful, Kathy and Enrique. We we had been pre-pandemic. I was very proud of the uh, well-maintained a file drawer uh, with the final <laughs> reports that were available to you to sign out on a library card system, but that sounds very, seems very quaint and antiquated <laughs> uh, now. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. we will get, uh, we will get with, uh, with the uh, technological uh, updates uh, because that's, that's an excellent point. That's right. And so, so that work is under, underway also just to sort of track so that we know um, what's in the queue and we can um, if in the event as a group if the, as a commission decides that they you know that there's some priority that needs to shift we can you know work with Loretta and her team but uh, certainly that you know the good news is that 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 body has now grown we can be you know we can do our own homework uh, and, and go in and, and read things that we need at our own leisure and not have to trouble you with sending it to us. So, 
uh, Commissioner O'Brien, uh, Amika, did you have another point, or was that the one that you wanted? To no, make? no, it's um, you know, it's I I I agree with um, the fact that you know they're always available. I didn't want to create the impression that that, that they have not been. No, uh, right. And uh, and I think that's important as we uh, and I know this is an effort uh, agency wide. Uh, you know, precipitated by the pandemic, but also a best practice to make more and more um, electronic uh, uh, versions yeah. of, of, of what of our work product, which is better for record keeping and and yeah. the like. Um, so as we move forward with this effort um, incrementally, you know, it's it's good to continue to have that in mind. That it's um, we appreciate uh, not only the work that you do, but being able to read it from time to time in the form of the final report when they're available. Yeah, it just would allow more flexibility for us when we're thinking about something. Oh, I remember and not having to trouble the team. So that's great. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I agree with everything that has been said. I, I do want to thank the team also. I know having done investigations work, how much I used to prize the face-to-face -face interviews. So I, I want to laud all of you for making the shift this past year and going to remote interviews. I know that's not an easy choice. Um, and I think you guys did it pretty well and, you know, kept up with the pace, which is impressive given everything that was going on. Um, I do agree um, with Enrique's suggestion about access through SharePoint, et cetera. And then, as you mentioned, Chair, we've had some conversations in terms of um, whether an access database or some other tracking system so that we as commissioners know who the qualifiers are in the queue. A, I think it allows us to know what changes in, uh, in the higher up structures of the licensees have happened. That's helpful to know particularly who's you know rotating in and out uh, and then also because there's sort of a, a temporary status to the qualifiers um, ability to work it's also nice to know what the timing is in terms of how this is working its way through the system so i do think that that would complement what enrique suggested in terms of the final product once it's done so we're not um you know needlessly to look at that but then also to know what's coming up in the queue so if we felt like there was something um you know, pressing that we were curious about in terms of just timing, we'd have the ability to know about it. Commissioner O'Brien, uh, Cameron, do you think that the commission's ready for that kind of access? Do you think that's helpful? Uh, the way it was just explained, absolutely. With, you know, not interfering, but but having access without bothering a team member. I think that, that really makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to um, just go back to Monica's presentation. Um, uh, Monica, I, I've been fortunate to be able to meet with you a few times and, and just recently had a great presentation from you. You always do such a, a thorough job. Um, you're meticulous and, and, and I know that the entire team appreciates that. Like Commissioner Cameron, I, I noted you know, even today, you made it a point to say that within, uh, you, you know, how much you value collaboration. And also what I like is that you've, um, you value the benefit of a checks and balances within your own team that you share among yourselves to make sure that there's compliance, that you're not missing um, anything. I, 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 um, I miss that ability to do that on a regular basis because of our open meeting law with my fellow commissioners. So when you said that, there was a little ping in my heart because it's exactly what I think is so beneficial in work quality that when you turn to your colleagues and say, you know, if I got this right. So I, you know, I, I, I have seen that in your work since I've, um, you know, joined the commission and, and, um, and can see the strength um, of your leadership and the strength of your team because of it. And of course, I also noted, you know, the impact on um, COVID. Is there anything other than the, not, and, and of course, it's such a substantial piece, but other than the, um, ability to meet in person and, and gain the benefits of, of a personal meeting that you would say has been a, a challenge um, uh, because of COVID? Um, I mean, I don't, I can't think of anything on the top of my head right now, but I think the interviews is probably the biggest thing that I would highlight. You know, we gained a lot from doing them in person, you know, reading the body language or, you know, the tone of voice, things like that. So, uh, and switching that to the virtual type, and sometimes uh, those you don't you know, capture uh, right away. So that was yeah, the biggest uh, challenge that we've kind of come across this past year. 
And in terms of being able to collect the records that you need um, from uh, the candidates, did the, did you see that there was a, a, a greater There was um, of some, some delays, uh, understandably, obviously, because uh, some of the vendors, they do have furloughs um, during this period of time. And if they didn't have the staff to do it, obviously, we we experienced some delays in getting those documents, uh, but they are always very communicative about, you know, where they are in the process, what they're hoping to get and the timeline that they give us. So uh, as long as, you know, we keep in touch with our vendors and applicants, uh, we can definitely get through uh, and get all the documents that we need. That, that's good to hear. That's good as long as they were communicative, that's good. Okay, my final point, I saw all those platforms has anybody else used Blue Jeans Meeting? Did you see that? <laughs> I didn't get. Did you see? That's I, I, I sometimes say say I'm, in, I'm, in I'm sorry. I sometimes have blue jeans when I'm coming to these meetings, but that's not <laughs> what I mean. I know. I wondered if that was a new platform that had emerged just during this time. But anyway, um, I, I got the point. It's a very clever name. So. Anyway, thank you. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. And, and um, demystifying. What I love too about Monica B's approach is not only the collaborative approach, but you're you're innovative. You're always looking for better, best practices and how you can improve um, the the, um, uh, the outcome of your investigations. Which we I know that uh, Loretta values and Karen values, and of course my fellow commissioners and I value so much. So thanks. Really nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the input and the compliments. I'll definitely share that with the team. And now about your baking. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> well, we'll discuss that later. <laughs> Great. Thanks. So, hey, yeah, thank you, Monica. And you know, I did want to give a shout out to, to Monica individually. She was one of our first financial investigators that we hired and she uh, moved up through the ranks and was instrumental in developing these processes and procedures, which I know from my own experience is really hard, you know, to, to build this from scratch, to build the team, to build this to get, uh, you know, as a new agency and a new division within the agency. I just want to compliment her and also just the culture she's created in that team. That is a team. You know, you see them when we're in the office, they do things together. They walk to the lunch area together. You know, it's really nice to see, you know, that's what you see in a leader. So thank you, Monica. I want to compliment you on that. Okay, so uh, the next item is item 3C, um, which is the racing opening day update. So given that opening day is coming up on Monday, Alex is just going to give us a little bit of an update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Lightbound. Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Executive Director Wells mentioned, Monday is our first day of live racing. The meet is 110 days, and um, It'll end the day after Thanksgiving. It'll start off three days a week, uh, Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, one of the highlights will be July 25th when they hold the Spirit of Massachusetts and the Clara Barton races, which have been a success. Um, if you remember last year, we were just being able to open a couple of weeks before that race in July due to the COVID. So we're in a be much better spot this year. Um, talking about the... Um, protocols um, for COVID, we, I spoke um, to Director Lilios and then um, to uh, Steve O'Toole, Director of Racing for Plain Ridge, and um, Alice Tisbert, the Managing Director of HHANE, the Horsemen's Association, and um, we are not asking for any changes to the COVID plans. So those same plans that we had in effect last year um, is what we're going to start off with for this year as well. Um, we have already uh, had some of our seasonal staff come back last week and, and even more of them this week. They held qualifier races on Monday and there were 11 races and around 90 horses participated as well as their 30 trainers. Um, so that's great to get them back in the uh, swing of things. We are uh, holding um, another set of qualifiers tomorrow at Pine Ridge and the entries for that are today. So. We'll get another batch of uh, horses that'll be all set to race uh, for next week. Um, I want to thank the HR team, Troop D Banda, uh, Natasha Martin, and Jacqueline Connect. Um, they've been very helpful on onboarding our um, returning folks and as well as um, finally finalizing our team with some new people for this year. 
So uh, once again, it um, involves a lot of paperwork, interviews, and the whole thing. And I do want to thank them for that. We're gonna have I to. Also, we're gonna have to type to them and tell them to read. <laughs> Um, I also want to um, welcome Sergeant McCormick to the um, Racing Division uh, Racing Unit. Um, he's going to be joining us this year. Uh, he was a trooper at Plain Ridge um, on the gaming side for a while, so um, I probably a lot of people already know him. Um, we've licensed 140 new people so far this year, and um, as you know, down at Plain Ridge, a lot of the participants do take out a three year license. So we have more than that um, licensed overall, but um, it's always good to see um, people coming in and renewing licenses. And um, I think that uh, covers the um, opening of the meet. Um, we're looking forward to being able to finish a whole meet this year. Thank I you. Uh, I see that North is here. Good morning. Um, North, I don't know if you want to chime in after Dr. Lightbound, but I'm just looking to see what the weather is. Have you looked yet, Alex, to see what weather is for Monday? I have not. I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Oh, 40% chance up here in where I live. Well, let's hope it stays dry. Yes. I'm leaning toward the 60%. Uh, North, good morning. Good morning. How are you, Commissioner, Madam Chair? Well, thank you. Good. Yeah, no, we're, we're looking forward. It's a beautiful spring day here in Plain Ridge um, in Plainville. The weather is gorgeous. The track is in good condition. The paddocks are ready, swept out, prepped with hay, um, and uh, we, we're ready to go. So we're looking forward to a great meet. Uh, we appreciate um, everything Dr. Lightbaum and her crew has done to help get us ready. Uh, Steve and his team have been great as well. So looking forward to a great day. I uh, do hope at some point you guys are able to come out and spend a day at the races. Well, well I'm going to talk to Dr. Lightbound about um, if, if, I, if I could join, I would like to join. So that's, I'll be showing up. I can, right. I can say that. Uh, right. Looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much. And, and any questions for Dr. Lightbound? Just Commissioner Cameron. Yep, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lifem, I'm glad that all the preparations are going smoothly. I know there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to get ready for a meet like this on both the uh, racetrack side of the house and the regulatory staff side of the house. I'm happy you got most of your team back and I know you'll do a good job with the new folks getting them uh, broken in. Um, a new sergeant on board, how many have we seen? But it's great. It's great for um, Sergeant McCormick to come over and learn the racing side of the house. So I hope he's looking forward to that. And I know I'm looking forward to live racing this year um, after having taken a, taken last year off due to, uh, due to uh, COVID. But yeah, I, I look forward to getting out and seeing and hopefully we'll have some more records broken this year. What do we think, Alex? Yes, yeah, I think it'll be a great year and we'll plan on a lot more records being broken. Excellent. In both the Sire Stakes races, the Mass Bread races and with uh, the Claire Barton and uh, Spirit of Mass. Yep. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alex. Any other questions for um, Alex or Nora? Okay. All right. We're all set. Thank you so much. And Karen. And the last item for the administrative update, I just wanted to recognize one of our longtime employees who's going to be leaving us. So Marianne Bratton, which I know uh, she is on the meeting today. So hello, Marianne. I just wanted to uh, thank you for all the work you have done over the years. She has been instrumental to the licensing division uh, and really has uh, upheld the core vet, one of our core values of customer service when it comes to dealing with uh, the external parties that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, she's also been really helpful um, just to within uh, uh, the IEB licensing collaboration. So really just want to say thank you to Marianne and give uh, Nikisha and Derek an opportunity to say a few words because both of them worked with, you know, Nikisha is her supervisor right now and then Derek worked with her during the transition. Just give them an opportunity to say a few words. It is a big deal because Marianne has been with us a long time and she's made some wonderful contributions to our office. So I want to say thank you. So I'll start with Nikisha and let her just say a few words. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners, and everyone. So this is bittersweet. Um, I think most of you all know Marianne, or at least have had the opportunity to cross paths with her at some 
point or another. Um, as Karen said, she's been at MGC uh, in the licensing division pretty much right at its inception in 2014. Um, and that's the reason me and the rest of the licensing team think of her as the backbone of the group. She's seen many iterations of things over the years. She understands uh, and can explain the many different perspectives. Um, and she can do her job with both eyes closed. <laughs> well, maybe not, but, but <laughs> she's really good. Um, um, and, but we're definitely losing a valuable resource. Um, it's a, a good opportunity for her to be uh, moving onward and upward. Um, she's taken a, a, a position at DCAM, another state agency. It's the Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. Um, and she'll be uh, a certification specialist over there. So if you all would please uh, join me in congratulating her on her new position. As I said, it is, it is a tough loss for, for the team. Um, she's contributed so much. And, you know, I haven't known Marianne for a long time, but you know, she was instantly uh, someone reliable um, that I could go turn to when I needed all my questions answered about you know, why things are the way they are. Um, so Marianne, best wishes to you. Uh, please don't be a stranger to us. Thank you, Nikisha. I'll turn it over to Derek. Uh, good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, Marianne. I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure working with Marianne. Uh, we started at the Gaming Commission right around the same time in 2014 on the 10th floor of 84 State Street. Uh, Marianne has been a key contributing member to, member to the licensing division from the day she arrived. Um, she's worked with us through two licensing systems, two office moves, four changes in her supervisor, whether it be a licensing director, chief, or manager. She's worked through multiple policy and procedure drafts and redrafts, as well as amendments, and not to mention the opening of three casinos with thousands of employees and vendors license. Uh, for a very brief but rewarding time, I had the honor of working with Marianne and the licensing team daily, and I can tell you her commitment to excellent customer service, historical knowledge, and her continuous quest for more skills and, un and understanding cannot be replicated or replaced. What is even more amazing than her professional persona are her attributes as a human being. Marianne is compassionate, friendly, straightforward, and an honest person with a very keen sense of humor. Um, when we moved to our permanent space at 75101, uh, the finance office was very lucky to share space with some of the licensing team. Marianne would add so much knowledge, perspective, and sense of humor to our morning conversations. Marianne is the type of person who will offer assistance to you at her own expense and not complain about it to anyone in the background. I don't know if many of you know this, but Marianne actually helped the finance office with some invoice processing for a few years so that she could get relevant experience for her advanced studies. And she did this while balancing her own workload. I will truly miss Marianne. Working with her and watching her grow professionally and responsibility and knowledge has been a pleasure. Um, Deep Kim is very lucky to be getting you, but as Nakisha and Karen both said, we're the ones that are losing out. Um, Marianne, please realize my thanks and words cannot even begin to address all the good you've done for the citizens of the Commonwealth. And then in this quick thank you, I had to admit literally, omit literally thousands of meaningful contributions you've made. I wanna close out my remarks by saying thank you, Marianne, for the lives you have positively impacted, including mine at the MGC. And for all of the thousands of employees and companies you and the licensing division have assisted in a selfless manner so that the gaming industry can help provide jobs to citizens and add fuel to the Massachusetts economy. I'm sad to see you leaving the MGC. I am, however, happy for you, for your new opportunity and for the Commonwealth because you will remain a state employee. You understand and embrace the awesome responsibility it is to be a public servant. If you're ever again in a situation where you're looking for a job, I hope the first place you'll come is the Mass Gaming Commission. That's it. Thank you. When I stop yeah. crying, Derek, I'd like to say something. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so it has been my absolute pleasure over the better part of a decade, um, and I actually started in 2013, um, <laughs> to serve our colleagues and our licensees, as well as those who are tangent to our mission, including a few folks who called me when I first started to ask how to get a fishing license and what to do about getting a moose out of their pool when the Gaming Commission was young and had not yet become as well covered in the media <laughs> as we are now. Uh, so as some of you know, I began as a receptionist and this is why I was fielding those calls. So um, I uh, thankfully was prepared with the tools I needed to get that caller to the mass wildlife folks and help them out. Um, but as Derek said, what we do matters here. Uh, our work results in so many positives, jobs, you know, contracts for vendors, successes for licensees, tax dollars for important programs, community grants for surrounding communities and um, groundbreaking research on the impacts of gaming and how to mitigate that. So I really wanna thank you all, especially my mentors, <laughs> Derek, and uh, immediate coworkers and Nikisha for providing me the experience and the tools to balance our mission of great service with the need for rigorous uh, regulation. Um, so as Monica just detailed for us, uh, we have to be mindful of the burden of regulatory obligations and provide really thoughtful service uh, and make sure that's accessible to everybody while our stakeholders navigate the licensing process, which can be intimidating. Um, one of mm. my great joys over the course of uh, my time here has been the number, the number of times I have heard, I can't believe I'm dealing with the state agency. Um, some folks have a perception, rightly or wrongly, that they can't get help. And so um, I'm glad to say that the licensing team, among many other departments here, has really turned that perception around. I'm so proud to have worked with everybody who is as dedicated to the mission as my friends and colleagues uh, here have been and hopefully will be at DCAM. Um, I will miss you all very much. <laughs> and I'll just be right around the corner at Ashburton. Thanks. Thank you, Marianne. Karen, I, I, um, I, I think Marianne knows that her video wasn't on, right? <laughs> uh, so that was by choice. Um, Marianne, uh, I, I think you just got such nice recognition from your, your two most recent supervisors, but most, mostly colleagues. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow commissioners right now. Um, who would like to go first? Why don't we? Okay, Commissioner Zunica. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was uh, very well, um, very well done, everybody. Uh, Marianne, um, I think you captured the essence of a culture that uh, that we tried to have here from the beginning. So it's really great to hear you say for those um, words uh, about uh, how we're perceived with the people that we deal with in terms of customer service, that has been a huge principle um, uh, that has carried through the agency. And I'm happy to see that um, being implemented uh, with the likes of, of you, especially. I remember one of my takeaways from uh, all the years, I remember you as well from 84 State Street, one of the, our first employees, um, is your good spirits, which I think um, go a long way towards this uh, customer service and your flexibility. Um, as as uh, outlined by Derek and Nakisha, we've had a number of different iterations in building a licensing and really an agency. And that has meant uh, that uh, uh, um, the need to be um, flexible, but also have good spirits about it in order to be able to make it work. So good luck with um, with your uh, with your next phase. Your contributions have been uh, tremendous. And uh, thank you for everything that you contribute. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, if I could just add, um, Marianne, you, you bring back the memories of some of those early phone calls and how well you were able to navigate some of those very, very strange uh, phone calls with a sense <laughs> of humor. That's always so important because we were new. We were all just kind of doing everything there was to be done, right? Um, I love your story about starting as a receptionist and moving up not only through our organization, but continuing your studies. That's something I didn't know. That you were able to work with Derek's team in order to professionally advance uh, your education and now moving on to another agency to further advance um, is just a great story and you should be proud of that. Um, I'm hoping we could we helped a little bit. It sounds like maybe we did with this uh, 
with your growth and your abilities to to move ahead and um, just just offer the state something uh, at a different level at all times. So I'm sure they will love having you and it will be our loss, but I always think it's so important to, to move ahead and we support that and just thank you so much for all the contributions. Commissioner Brian. Uh, Marianne, I do. I wish you luck. Also, I think one of the nicest things you can hear from a boss when you leave is sort of the, the overture that you're welcome back um, whenever. Um, and so I think it's great that the skills you took here, you were able to use. And then I, I do think it's great you're staying in state government that someone like you is continuing. Uh, the, the Commonwealth continues to benefit from your service. Um, I wish you luck. And then as Derek said, you know, the, the MGC is still here. So who knows what kind of skills you get at DCAM and then, you know, maybe come back at some point in the future. But until then, you know, uh, I wish you luck and enjoy the cafeteria in Ashburn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and, and Marianne, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, such um, really wonderful accolades from Akisha and Derek. And and you, you could tell so heartfelt, but I know that they represent uh, the entire Gaming Commission sentiments. Um, you, you know, folks are here today and they're, um, uh, they're in, in many ways I can speak for them that they're sorry that they're not getting to say goodbye to you today in person. And the good news is that you really are going to be around the corner. So um, I, I know that you'll be sharing your experiences at DCAM. DCAM is super lucky. Um, they're a smart agency and they scooped you up. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for you. And um, you know, while we suffer losses, the Commonwealth benefits overall. And uh, I thought uh, Commissioner O'Brien's observation that you know you've been invited back uh, if uh, if it if and when the time comes, the doors seem to be prepared to be open. If there's an, an uh, opportunity here. So very, very best wishes. Um, I can say my big takeaway was meeting with your team um, in the past in person, was recognizing that in so many ways you are the face to the public, um, this group. Nikisha, um, you know, your team, interacts so much with um, the um, all the folks who, who really want to benefit from the Expanded Gaming Act and get jobs. And Marianne's um, style just uh, really made, made me realize um, we, we were really well positioned to do that well. So Marianne, you, you've um, got a whole team that you're leaving, but they've had the benefit of learning a lot from you. So. I wish you luck. Uh, you'll do great. Thanks, commissioners, and thanks everyone else. I really appreciate you. And I'm going to go mute now because I'm still crying. <laughs> oh. okay, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. So, so on that uh, lovely note, uh, that ends the administrative update. Great. Well, thank you. Um, tough to do this virtually, but yeah, um, yeah, but heartfelt, you know. Um, does anybody want a break now or after? Um, Commissioner Zunica, I'm looking at you. Yeah, maybe five minutes real quick, five, just a quick Five minutes we... before we go into the Game Sense report. I think that yeah. might make some good sense. Um, I'll take, uh, it is right now uh, 11 o'clock and we'll reconvene in five minutes, 11.05. Thank you. Looks like we can get started. I'll just do a roll call to confirm we're all here. Commissioner Cameron? I'm here. Commissioner O'Brien? I am here. Commissioner Zuniga? Here. Here we are. Okay. Um, Karen, we're going to move on now to item number uh, four, um, Director of Research and Responsible Gaming, Mark Vanderlinden. Hi, Mark. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, so today we have uh, the quarterly update for the GameSense program. Um, I'm joined by Odessa Dorica, um, Charlie Ordilly, and Chelsea Turner. Um, Marlene Warner is hanging in the wings um, for questions and, and discussion following, as well as Teresa Fiore. Um, so today, the, the Game Sense update, um, I think, is, is really interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Problem Gambling Awareness Month and the activities that happen there. 
um, as well as just other activities both inside and outside of the casino. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Chelsea Turner. Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to share my screen if that's okay. Give me one second here so I can just turn on the audio. Okay, can everybody uh, see the presentation? Terrific. All right, so my name is Chelsea Turner. I'm the Director of Responsible Gambling at the Massachusetts Council on Gaming and Health. And I'm, jo I'm joined here by two of my colleagues, Charlie Ordell, who is a game sense supervisor at Plain Ridge Park Casino and is really sort of the captain of the team there, as well as uh, Odessa Dwarica, who um, really leads our programs and services efforts and all of the community outreach efforts for the game sense team. Um, we're really excited to be here today, uh, so thank you in advance for your time. Uh oh. Sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so Mark said we are going to talk about Problem Gambling uh, Awareness Month quite a bit. Um, we're also going to start by talking about some of the interaction numbers at each of the properties. Um, we'll touch on our Excellence Awards, which are awards for really for casino staff that go above and beyond um, when it comes to responsible gambling. Um, we'll, we'll weave in communications highlights throughout this report. Um, but we'll also spend a, a minute or two talking about that, um, touch on all of our outreach and engagement efforts, and then wrap up and answer any questions that you all have. So these are our third quarter interaction numbers. And what I think is very interesting as you look at these numbers is you look sort of across the top and you look at the, th the top three circles, um, you're going to see a, a big jump year over year. Now, obviously, last year during the month of March, um, we were only open for two months or, or two weeks of the four week period. So you would expect that our numbers would be higher this year. But our numbers are higher by double. And we're doing that with less staff. So um, and in and while COVID is still a, a big deal, and while we have traffic issues and stuff like that. So I'm really, really pleased to see these numbers. Um, you know, if you look at PPC, the numbers are almost double. Um, MGM, again, almost double, and really um, Encore hit it out of the park um, over, the, over the last quarter, particularly in March. Then if you look, what I think is even more interesting, if you look down and you look at the demonstrations and, ex and exchanges, which are really the significant interactions that we have, either with patrons or, uh, well, with patrons, um, and that's, those are two-way interactions. Um, not simply, you know, am I, where's the restroom, or I need a cup of coffee. Um, if you look at those numbers, those are really high. And so those are the quality interactions. So looking at those gives me um, a, a big smile on my face, at least. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight were the VSE numbers. Um, so our VSE numbers are, are, I think, bouncing back up to where they need to be. Um, but if you look at the last quarter at EBH, you're going to see really, I think, strong numbers. And what's most interesting about those numbers, what you can't see from this chart, is that in the month of January, we had two remote VSEs. In the month of February, we had three remote VSEs, and two of our VSEs occurred during our overnight shift. And in the month of March, we had six remote VSEs, and three VSEs occurred in the overnight shift. So, the, the sort of the new things that we've brought in to the game spends program around, in, around VSCs, both um, having the overnight shift um, and being available 24 hours a day for folks really in these crisis situations um, that need a VSC and being able to offer them remotely um, seems to be working um, pretty well. Obviously, this is just a snapshot in time, but um, I think we're trending in the right direction. So some things to keep in mind, sort of just as you look at those numbers, um, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, as I said, we have fewer staff. Um, you know, I already talked about March. 
Um, the hours were reduced and, you know, we just popped back up to 24 hours a day uh, in late January. Capacity has been limited there. The traffic patterns are challenging for us. Um, some of the games have been closed. Um, and interactions are just playing out harder, right? Because people are wearing masks and people aren't, even, even though it's getting better and it feels better, um, and I think our staff feel safe, um, it's still harder, right? It's, it's different when you don't see somebody smile. And that's what our Game Sense advisors are used to doing. But most importantly, the takeaway here is that we're really getting fantastic numbers here, good quality interactions, and again, trending in the right direction. So I want to spend uh, a little bit of time, a small chunk of time today, talking about PGAM. And normally PGAM is focused on the back of the house. So we're focused on casino, the casino staff. Um, this year, we weren't able to be back of the house uh, for safety reasons uh, like we normally are. Um, so we utilize technology um, by doing quizzes, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. Um, and we also did a lot front of the house. We actually did a lot with the patrons as well. Um, we had outreach efforts that we'll touch on in a little bit, and then we also had uh, various uh, social media and communications efforts. So I'm going to weave some of these in throughout our presentation, and the first thing I want to show you is a, a fun little social media clip um, that we did uh, that highlights basically the importance of understanding the games, and we aired this throughout the month of PGAM. Having a hard, sorry about this. I practiced this yesterday with Teresa. Uh, Chelsea, you're on a, a PDF. Does that make a difference? Oh, I should not be on a PDF. Um, it does. Give me one second. Chelsea, you might need to on share your screen and go back to sharing if you're gonna get another application. Okay, give me one second, sorry about this. If you don't have the other version, perhaps Mark, Teresa, or you have it handy? I have it. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah, if I could just add while she's pulling that up, um, I think that the, the numbers highlight it, but but just to take a step back from it a mem minute and just realize just, you know, they, these are amazing folks, our Game Sense advisors, who, um, you know, during the last several months with, with a lot of challenges um, that they're facing, we're still there um, and providing a really valuable service to our casino guests. Um, so, so I, I think it's worth recognizing, and I really thank um, our Game Sense advisors for for doing that day in and day out. Sorry about that, and thank you, Mark. Hopefully, this works. So let's try one more time. So that's just a fun little clip that we um, aired throughout the month of March and sort of demonstrates, um, you know, the spirit of PGAM. Um, what you're looking at now is a, just a sort of a, a chart that we use to sort of graph out some of the things that we were doing. So you can see, you know, we kicked off that the month of PGAM with a press release, of course. We helped uh, work on the governor's proclamation. Um, there was digital ads that really ran throughout the month. Um, those, and when I talk about digital ads, I actually mean internally within the casino. So we worked with each of the properties so that there was um, a lot of signage at, at all of them um, about PGAM and awareness for problem gambling. Um, on the 9th, we had a gambling disorder screening day. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And each week we had different qu quizzes that were pa patron and staff facing. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. So. So these are, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So these are the quizzes that we ran 
throughout the month of March. So each full week during March, we ran a different quiz. And for the casino staff, we administered those. We worked with the um, with our liaisons at the at the properties to administer them digitally. And then we at the game sense centers um, administered them using uh, predominantly using the large screen monitors. Um, so the first week we focused on positive play um, and tried to educate folks about gambling literacy, pre-commitment, and other elements of positive play, which we're going to continue to hear a lot about. Um, in week two, we talked about voluntary self-exclusions um, and tried to highlight and showcase our efforts there and the importance of BSEs. Um, in week three, we had a little bit of fun, um, focused on March Madness. Um, and talked about sports betting and a little bit in odds. And in week four, um, we talked about the various re resources that are av available in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and PPC even went a an additional week, um, that last half week of March, and did a superstitions week, a superstitions quiz for that week. So uh, a lot of interactions that helped to contribute to those good numbers that you saw in the charts earlier. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is March 9th, which is National Gambling Disorder Screening Day. Um, we partnered with the folks at Cambridge Health, which is something that we do annually. And you can see the numbers here um, for screen, the, all the screens that we did on each, each of these days in person. Um, the screens are really a three question quick quiz, uh, not, I mean, quick, quick assessment, if you will, that ask questions about you know, in the last 12 months, the first one is, have you become restless, irritable, or anxious when you try to stop or shut or slow down your gambling? The second one is, have you ever, during the last 12 months, have you ever tried to keep your family or friends from knowing how much you gambled? The third question is, during the last 12 months, did you ever have, get into financial trouble um, and had to get help? And so what I think are interesting about these results is if you look at the number of folks that have a positive screen, it's actually higher than what the app, what, what the sort of rate is in the state of Massachusetts for folks that have problem gambling. Now, I'm not necessarily surprised by that because we're in a casino asking these questions, so we probably have a higher concentration of folks who gamble at the casinos, but I thought it was really interesting. And in talking to the um, GSAs who administered these afterwards, they said that they think that actually the numbers would have probably been higher, that people aren't exactly always 100% truthful or comfortable answering these questions. Um, we think it's an important initiative to be a part of. We were happy to do it. And, um, you know, certainly we've, uh, of course, fo already followed up with um, Cambridge Health with all of our results. So the next thing I wanted to talk um, about briefly is just our sort of enhanced links to problem gambling and responsible gambling resources. And I think everybody knows that there's a new helpline number, 1-800-327-5050. Um, um, and we've been doing a, quite a bit to help to promote that number. So through social media, um, et cetera, they, you know, the, the kind of one of the, I think, benefits of this, the new helpline that DPH is administering is that it's coordinated with their substance use helpline. So, as they're, as they're screening folks for substance use, they're also screening folks for gambling disorder. So if we receive any calls about people who are in need of clinical services, we are now referring them to that helpline and have been doing that for some time um, and really trying to sort of boost, boost these, these efforts and initiatives. So the second thing is we wanted to, the number that we were originally using to answer these calls before um, DPH took over the helpline um, was the 1-800-426-1234 number. And this is a number that has a long history with the Mass Council. And so, um, you know, and, and folks are, you know, the, the numbers in a lot of places. And so we wanted to find a use for the number that we thought complemented the helpline. And so what we have done is really sort of repurpose that number into an, uh, a line where we can answer questions about the games themselves. So somebody has a question about um, the house edge or the mechanics behind a game or what the odds are of a game, the game sense advisor can certainly answer those questions. And more, most importantly, probably, we wanted to make sure that there was a direct line to BSEs, especially as 
Um, we're doing more and more remotely and digitally, and we have the ability to do, do remote BSEs. We thought it was important to preserve that um, direct connection. Um, so, um, and as I already mentioned, um, we are actively referring folks to the helpline. So we think that this, this complements one, one another and are happy about how it's been going so far. Um, and then the last thing is we rolled out live chat at the end of Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Um, and so we've been having a lot of fun with that. The live chat is um, a feature embedded right into the Mass Council website. It's also on the um, GameSense website. And it allows anybody that um, goes on to the website to ask questions about the games, um, to ask questions. There's even a drop down about what is a VSC? Um, we had a really good call recently where a mom was concerned about her, her son's um, frequent lottery play, believe it or not, and was wondering what she could do. Um, so, you know, and wanted to know about, actually wanted to know about voluntary self-exclusion. So, um, so we feel like that's been going really, really well. We're going to, you know, this just launched, so I don't have a lot to report to you on that yet. Um, and we will have much more to report to you at our next quarterly presentation in June. Um, before I turn it over to Charlie to talk about sort of PPC and how they really hit it out of the park during Problem Gambling Awareness Month, I just wanted to quickly show you one more social media clip that um, features our helpline and the launch of the helpline, or sorry, the, not our helpline, our live chat and uh, launch of live chat and promoting live chat. So. So we're really sort of taking both the Safer Gambling education line and live chat and focusing on how the games work themselves, any questions folks have about the games as well as VSEs. Um, and again, anything clinical, we uh, refer over to the DPH helpline. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie. Um, oops. Charlie from <laughs> Plain Ridge Park Casino. He's the senior game sense advisor there. And um, I'm going to let him tell you about the great work of our game sense team there and the staff at PPC during PGM. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Commissioners. Good morning, Charlie. It is a beautiful day out there. I think we, yeah. should, we should take this outside. Um, so I just want to, I'm just going to highlight some uh, things that we did at uh, uh, Plain Ridge Park uh, for this uh, PGAM this year. As we all know, it's, uh, everything's been a challenge. And uh, so we, we what, what um, uh, Chelsea had said about the five quizzes, well, we went up a step, a step above. Um, what we did was we collaborated with uh, PPC and uh, we collaborated just to kick it up a notch. So, um, we offered uh, a few other things. Uh, PGAM tip of the day, which on that board there is uh, was a fun little um, uh, event for the uh, team members where uh, they would put in a daily tip, uh, a responsible slash uh, problem gambling tip of the day. They put it in uh, and for drawing, they draw it and put it up from the board. So at the end of the month, uh, they put one winner with the best, uh, excuse me, with the best uh, uh, tip of the day. Uh, so it was kind of fun. It was just get the members uh, uh, really into it and, it and it worked well. And if you see around that picture, there's some swag that we were giving out, um, uh, little uh, notepads with uh, gaming tips, game sense tips uh, on there, and, uh, some nice pens. Uh, what you see, uh, they take the pens before the uh, clips, but uh, it was all good. And uh, the magnetic uh, chip clips we call them, our chips tips and the chips clips. So. Um, it was fun. Uh, they really liked the swag, and we also had some other things. We also um, did a um, we we partnered with uh, PPC. They do an annual um, uh, event for St. Patrick's Day. So we thought about you know joining them and ask them if they would uh, you know be to, uh, let us uh, work with them on their on their program, and it, they were uh, more than more than helpful. And uh, so what we did 
we, we uh, supplied a basket with some uh, some um, St. Patty's Day novelties in there. Some obviously Game Sense swag, um, Game Sense literature on um, on uh, VSEs, uh, gaming tips, uh, where to get um, help, resources, different things like that. Play my way, obviously, and uh, a twenty-five dollar gift card. So. So the event was, uh, PPC was run an event where their team members would have to find, uh, in the back of the house, find a piece of gold, like gold. And um, they would turn, you know, whoever got the most pieces of gold, they turned it in for prizes. Uh, so what we did was, and, and, and this was HR for PPC, did a, did a great job coming up with, uh, with this. Um, uh, the, the team member who found the green, the Game Sense uh, green piece of gold, would win this basket. So throughout the day, um, they would do uh, an email blast to their team members with a clue, uh, a riddle and a clue to where this piece of gold may be hidden. So it, it created a lot of buzz in the back of the house. So when the team member found this piece of gold, it was, it was hidden in plain sight. It was behind our Game Sense bulletin board in the back of the house. They would have to go to get to get the piece of gold, they would have to go to the Game Sense Center, uh, locate a Game Sense advisor, and they would have to um, uh, answer three uh, problem gambling questions before they could receive the key for the uh, piece of gold. Get the key, they take the uh, get the gold, take it to HR to uh, for the prize. You know, we had some pictures. It was it was fun. Uh, they also PPC also supplied uh, uh, PGAM, the blue ribbons that you see throughout uh, PGAM for all the team members and the Game Sense team as well. Um, and next, extra week's quiz, as Kelsey said, uh, PBC uh, put up a $50 uh, gift card for an extra week, and it was a superstitions quiz, a fuzz, fun quiz about different superstitions and different cultures and things like that, uh, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, so uh, the team worked very hard, um, both PPC and uh, uh, the Game Sense team making this work, and it, and it worked out quite well. And I'd like to also uh, do a little shout out, a special thank you to uh, Lisa McKenney. She's a uh, manager of uh, compliance for people and her team in North for really going, you know, above and beyond to helping Game Sense. You know, we couldn't, you know, the collaboration and, and, and the attitude at uh, PPC, they're, they're, they're always there to help us, not only in uh, uh, for PGAM, um, but, you know, RGEW in, in September, that, that and us outside with, you know, with these, uh, you know, the challenging conditions, making sure we're all safe and what we do and, and a lot of other things as well. We're, uh, we're, we're currently working on a, a racing for the upcoming racing season, an incentive, which I'll, I'll get into in a moment, um, which, uh, you know, they've been really great with that. We're working on a property map. Uh, where where it's the PPC map where we're going to be putting some game sense uh, uh, tips and different um, things on uh, on their uh, property map as well. So um, yeah, so I wanted to thank uh, Lisa and her team for that. And the next um, the next uh, uh, section here is the uh, what Chelsea said the uh, excellence awards. So the uh, the Game Sense uh, Quarterly Champion Award acknowledges casinos to successfully incorporate uh, responsible gaming into their daily roles. So I'm um, going to start off with uh, EBH. Uh, actually, every um, every um, quarter that we pick three members from each property. So uh, for EBH, uh, the first uh, award winner was uh, Matthew O'Brien from the Security Department. Uh, Matthew was approached by a guest who mentioned that he he wanted to learn about table games. He escorted the guest to the Game Sense Info Center, introduced him to a Game Sense advisor. Uh, this simple question turned into a great conversation with the guest who may have not found Game Sense. Um, and on the next one was uh, Philip uh, Wakefield from Slots. Uh, Philip uh, frequently brings guests to the Game Sense Information Center uh, when they have questions about their gaming. He also interacts with the Game Sense team to learn more about the various games, uh, how the various games work to help to better help the guest uh, with inquiries uh, related to the slots. And then the final one from EBH is Alex Rodriguez. He's in the security department as well. Um, 
Alberto convinced the guest to come out uh, to the Game Sense Information Center after engaging with him for an extended period and observing his gaming behavior. Uh, he recognized the guests seemed to struggle to control their gaming activities and proceeded to approach him in a kind and professional manner. So that, uh, that's um, for EBH. Now I'm going to uh, go over to uh, MGM. MGM, um, so MGM has three as well. Um, when these awards for MGM are presented, they're presented um, in their quarterly uh, Feel Good Friday meeting and uh, where the team members recognized and uh, Amy, uh, the senior at MGM, would speak uh, you know, to, the, uh, to the, the, the team members there and uh, introduce these winners. Uh, so uh, the first winner was Daniel uh, Miller. Uh, he's the director of compliance. Since stepping into his role as director of compliance over a year ago, Dan has built and fostered relationships with the Game Sense team at MGM. He has been an enormous advocate for responsible gambling initiatives and has collaborated with Game Sense to create a new and innovative ways to reach both guests and team members. The next one is um, uh, Paige McKiskey. Uh, she's a marketing and assistant manager for special events. Paige has played an integral role in collaborating with GameSense to, uh, to assess promotional events at MGM, which allow us to find opportunities to engage guests with large, to engage with large groups of guests uh, to share the GameSense message. And the final one from MGM is um, Jeremy Payne. Jeremy is uh, in the sound and video and production manager. Uh, Jeremy has been essential in the game sense obtaining a beautiful monitor to display our, our responsible gaming materials at the game sense information center. Jeremy helped with the setup and technical issues that have come up. And then the final one at PPC, we have three uh, winners at PPC as well. Um, what we do at PPC, they have a team member appreciation day uh, once a quarter, or if with COVID, we really didn't have a team member appreciation day. Uh, so, but each team member was called down uh, in a group and we, uh, we presented the awards in the uh, HR training room um, with their managers uh, as well. So our first winner was um, Stephanie Rosenberg. She's a slot shift manager. Uh, while performing her many responsibilities, such as supervising staff and dealing with PPC guests, Need. Stephanie goes out of her way to assist guests who show signs of distress and finds the GSA on duty. Um, I've been, you know, Stephanie has brought people to me uh, on numerous occasions or, or, or directed me in their, in their direction just to monitor and talk to them if they needed to be talked to. Um, Derek Wilson. Derek is a HR coordinator for PPC. Uh, Derek was extremely helpful in this um, um, St. Patty's Day scavenger hunt with the uh, Game Sense Gold. Uh, Derek has always been there for Game Sense to assist in scheduling quarterly champion award ceremonies and with a massive help with the large number of toys that was collected for the uh, team members and guests during the Toys for Tots Chewy Drive. Uh, most recently, Derek and the HR team has done a fantastic job coordinating PGAM activities for PC team members, including Game Sense part of the Fool's Gold event and St. Patty's Day. And our final um, uh, award winner for PPC is um, Tom Metcakis. He's a security officer. Um, so um, Tom is there, always there for the guest and notifies Game Sense advisors of any game uh, games guest behavior that he feels we should observe. Also, during our, our GEW in September, uh, we had that table. We had a table event outside. Uh, at the valley entrance, and Tom, you know, Tom would answer guest questions and bring guests over to us, and, and you know, make sure they were social distance and different things like that. He he just went above and beyond in in uh, in his duties uh, while he was there. And so we want to uh, I want to thank every one of these uh, award winners um, for what they do for the Game Sense cause and, and uh, the the Game Sense program. They're they're an asset. So. Um, that's all I got, and uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Odessa. Oh, my, my bad. That's all, not all I got. So, um. Sorry, it's, it's just a little bit more of me, um, and, and a little bit more of Charlie, and then we're going to turn it over to Odessa. So, 
just really briefly wanted to touch on some of our communications efforts. And these efforts are really spearheaded by our communications team. That's Bill Sherwood and, and Mishai. Uh, and they do a fantastic job to push out social media, um, work with each of the properties uh, throughout the course of PGM. And you saw some of the, the fun videos earlier. Um, but one of the coolest, well, in addition to the, all, all of you can see how many social media graphics and stuff that we did, but one of the coolest things that we did, I think, during PGAM is we did something called geofenced advertising, um, which basically means we can literally draw a circle around the casinos, and if somebody is there and they have their mobile phone on them, and it's on for, we can set the time for an hour or two, they're gonna get a pop-up message, a game sense pop-up message. And so we, this is the first time we've tested geofencing, um, but we did it for five days at the end of PGAM, and we had 18,897 views in five days, um, and those are all folks inside the casinos. Um, the vast majority were at MGM, which is a little interesting, so we're probably going to try it again, and we wonder a little bit if we didn't draw the, the line big enough around PPC, for example, but I think the numbers were really successful. It's very inexpensive. And it's a way to do very tar direct targeting. So this is something we're going to continue to try in the fourth quarter, and we'll be back to you in June to talk. To, Phil Sherwood will be back to, to you in June to talk to you a little bit more about the analytics at that point in time. Um, and then, lastly, um, I just wanted to say that Charlie and the staff at Plain Ridge Park has, has really, again, done a fantastic job working with the casino staff at Plain Ridge Park. Um, in terms of the race season prep. Um, and so I'll turn it over to him again very briefly to let him tell you a little bit about what he and his team have been working on there. Yeah, so um, as we all know, last year was a challenge for racing. We didn't even know if it was going to take place because of COVID and that. So it was really tough to prepare. And, and it was just really it was very difficult. We had a presence down in the racing, but it was very difficult to really interact and communicate with the guests. But, so this year, things are, are a little different. We have some time to prepare, and we're really uh, looking forward to this upcoming racing season. So like Chelsea said, uh, you know, we've been in cooperate, you know, in coordination with uh, uh, PPC, with the racing division. And uh, we have, we've had some, um, you know, discussions about what we would like to do down there. And they, they've been open to everything. And it really, it's been really great, actually. So a couple of things that we have, we have this, um, this banner here, I'd like to wager, uh, let GameSense be your running mate. That's a banner that's in the, um, we had installed at the, uh, in the racing, it's down by uh, the, uh, uh, the electronic terminals. It can be seen from anywhere in the, inside the racing, uh, inside the race book. We also have um, that ad with, uh, with Tori right there on the right hand side, actually trained to help keep the game fun. That's a full page ad that it's going to be ran in the racing program for the entire uh, racing, live racing season. Um, good way to get our message out there. Um, and it, you know, it's really good. And then um, we also have some other things that we're working on uh, during the planning stations, in the planning stages. We're gonna have a tabling event. We're gonna have um, preferably outside during the, uh, um, through a few different uh, events uh, this season, but uh, most notably, um, the Spirit of Massachusetts uh, trot in um, in July, July 25th. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be outside of that event, um, which is a big event. A lot of families, a lot of uh, uh, kids. I want to say kids. A lot of families coming out, and, uh, you know, watching the races as well. So we have that going on. And uh, uh, Lenny, the track announcer, he's going to be uh, you know advertising, making announcements about game plans over the. Uh, when he's calling the race, you know, he races or whenever he, he feels that he can uh, get a plug in for game sense. So, um, so we're looking forward to uh, racing this year. It should be fun. Hopefully the weather's great. And uh, yeah, so. Now Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Charlie. We're going to turn it over to Odessa now to talk a little bit about community outreach and engagement and some of our additional community supports. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Odessa Dwarika. I'm the Director of Programs and Services at the Council, and 
I, I was just struck uh, by listening to Charlie because I've been working more with GameSense since July and they know how to make public health fun. Like I've learned, I've been in public health for more than 20 years and they're the first ones where it's completely fun, it's completely based on relationship building and it's all carrot and no stick. And <laughs> I think that's the way it should be. So <laughs> I just had to say that. So with the closing of you know, senior centers, community centers, programs, classes, like everybody else, uh, we've had to pivot with outreach to ensure that Game Sense messaging is still reaching the community. Um, when in-person access to priority populations has been suspended, we've often still been able to reach the providers um, that serve them. So we do this via video presentations and we really focus on helping them carry and game sense knowledge onto their clients. We've also been able to collaborate with Max, Mass Access. It's a community access TV station. They're amazing. Uh, they've helped us reach households all across the state uh, with game sense programming and public service announcements. Uh, we did this with a show created for older adults and we're in the process of designing something similar for veterans. We expect to be filming that early to mid-May. And we really hope to finish out this year with a bang um, as vaccinations increase, warmer weather is upon us. Um, some organizations are returning uh, to in-person programming, um, scheduling tabling of, uh, events, outdoor events, and all of that. So we're looking forward to, um, to doing a lot more. Next slide. So we've been offering, we started offering capacity building support to agencies who serve the AAPI community. This is something that began kind of organically um, when an organization reached out to us saying, yeah, we'd love a game sense presentation, but we'd actually love a lot more than that too. We, we need more help and we wanna do more around gambling for our population. So when I say capacity building, I'm talking about a number of things that we can offer to an organization. I'm talking about, of course, game sense trainings for their clients that might be ESL clients or job training programs um, or other types of programs serving people in their communities. But I'm also talking about um, tailored trainings for staff that take a much deeper dive into problem gambling, recovery supports you know, to really help them understand um, gambling issues in their community. Um, we've opened up our spring, our spring training calendar. This is a calendar of clinical trainings that we offer, that the Mass Council offers, and we've um, had providers for this organization take the trainings at no cost. For example, we just held a two-hour webinar by Dr. Tim Fong. He's out of UCLA, he did this update on Asian American treatment. And we had 21 providers join us who offer social services in Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cambodian language. So that was really exciting that they were able to hear him and bring that knowledge back uh, to their agency. Uh, for social workers and clinical providers in particular, these agencies were offering full scholarships to our Spring Training Institute, which is a 30-hour um, course on prevention assessment and treatment of gambling disorder with the trauma focus and health equity lens. And we've given eight scholarships so far to staff of AAPI organizations. And finally, um, any of the providers that we connect with through any of these trainings, we're also inviting them to become a VSC designated agent as well. An example of this has been our collaboration with the Asian American Civic Association. They have programming in Chinatown and Quincy. Um, the executive director, you know, was the one who reached out and said, we want more than just a game sense training. So we scheduled a video call and tried to figure out how could we better support them. And so we started by doing a game sense presentation for staff. There was a sense that the staff um, went to the casino a lot and needed a game sense um, training. And then we did a more in-depth presentation on problem gambling. Uh, they, they were interested in starting a support group for clients with disordered gambling. And so uh, Jody Neely, our recovery outreach liaison, was able to consult with them and give them feedback and support and talk them through um, some of the issues that might come up and some strategies to do this. And as their 
their programming started opening up again, their in-person programming, we were able to schedule three additional uh, GameSense uh, presentations for their client groups. So that was um, a big success. And their staff members took our clinical trainings and also signed up for our VSC designated agent training. So that's just one way we were able to kind of wrap support around an agency who wanted to do more. Um, and I think next slide. So our community support. So these are more looking at recovery and VSEs. Jody, our recovery liaison, um, she's been delivering customized resources all year. She's reached 157 uh, people this year with customized resources and referrals. Um, one of the most important resources I think that we offer is telephone recovery support. So for those of you who don't know, we call it TRS, and it's 12 weeks of phone meetings designed to support people working on harm reduction in their gambling or uh, support them in their early recovery. And it's an evidence-based peer-led intervention, and it's very low barrier. The person just needs to have a cell phone. Um, when we started offering this in July, I think we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know if folks were really going to want this, if it was going to be too much of a commitment. And um, we said, well, we'll try to reach 25 people. But 25 people so far have already engaged in TRS. So we did get a favorable response. And just to give you a little more context, we offered TRS to all of the 157 people who allowed us to follow up with them. This is whether it be after a VSE, after a call to a helpline, after talking to a game sense advisor on the floor. And 75% of the people um, who got follow up after a VSC also chose to enroll in TRS. Okay, so 75%. And if you look at the 123 non vsc follow ups, less than 10% of those folks chose to engage in TRS. So I thought those were really interesting numbers um, and thought that maybe it speaks to a higher level of motivation among VSC enrollees to change behaviors and enter a recovery process. So I think it's, it's an exciting beginning to that program. Um, for PGAM, uh, Jody conducted about 15 virtual VSC awareness trainings, uh, substance use disorder recovery centers across the state. Um, she also presented on VSEs as a key recovery tool in our three-part webinar series designed for peers. And then last but not least, uh, we've been on scheduling monthly trainings to certify community-based designated agents. And we know that VSE is a great tool on its own, um, but more importantly, I think it's just this precious opportunity to reach somebody in crisis and offer them more support. So we really want providers across the Commonwealth, based in the communities, to be knowledgeable and trained um, in the VSC process. That's what I got. Thanks so much, Odessa. So before we move on to questions, I just wanted to talk about something that we are super excited about. Um, and I know the Gaming Commission uh, is also excited about this. This is, I think, Mark Vanderlinden's, um, one of his favorite things is, is Play My Way, and as everybody knows, he's a, a pioneer um, in Play My Way, and it's a, it's a responsible gambling budgeting tool that we currently have at PPC, but is about to get rolled out at MGM. So we are uh, in meetings working with MGM about how this is gonna happen. Our hope is to launch um, in September. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into preparing for this. Um, we have a research partner, uh, Carleton University and have been meeting with uh, folks there. Uh, of course, Mark is leading these efforts. Um, and uh, there's going to be a, a study done, a longitudinal study with 600 folks um, at MGM. Um, and again, this is all coordinated with MGM. They've been fantastic partners right out of the gate on this project. Um, so 600 folks pre predominantly who play slots at MGM and there'll be a sort of a pretest, and then uh, two follow-up post-tests for the 600 participants in the study. Um, of course, they're incentivized a little bit through Amazon gift cards to participate, um, which is the hook to get them to continue in phases two and three of the project. But it's kind of cool that we're going to be able to sort of test um, 
test this a little bit along the way, sort of pre and post launch. Um, so GameSense is excited about this um, and trying to do everything we can to help facilitate this and make this a, an exciting launch, uh, make it a little bit of fun um, and make it as successful as possible. So you'll be hearing a lot more about this uh, uh, in uh, probably our next quarterly uh, presentation. And lastly, before we get to questions, um, I wanted to uh, also thank a couple other people that um, I wanted to mention. One, Alex Lightbaum, who has been really kind and helpful in t helping us think through what are some of the ways that we can have more of a game sense presence um, on the racing side. Um, so we really, really appreciate her time and efforts. Um, and then also, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank uh, North Brownsell at um, Plain Ridge Park, who's a general manager there. And while Lisa's our sort of day-to-day -day person on the ground at PPC, um, leadership often starts from the top down. And so he was the one that actually allocated, without any of us asking, extra resources to go towards their PDM efforts. So I just wanted to give him a shout out as well. Um, and finally, before questions, we are hiring at GameSense. So we had somebody move on, and in order to sort of maintain staffing and get ourselves back to a place um, where we have sufficient staffing, we are doing just a little bit of hiring at GameSense. So if you know anybody that is interested, um, please have them visit our website, um, macgh.org, um, and we're also looking for a few good college interns. So please help us spread the word. Um, and with that said, we would be happy to take any questions you have. Great, um, Chelsea, thank you. If you could, oh, great, perfect. Questions, um, commissioners, who, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, do you wanna go first now? Would you like to lean in? I don't in? really have any questions, but I, I, I'm happy to hear you um, sort of give a nod to Alex and to PPC. I was, it was great to hear the horse racing. You know, I, I've always been impressed with the Game Sense presentations, but that's, it's always been an aspect off to the side. And so it was really exciting for me to hear how you guys have, you know, tried to pull, bring that into the fold, so to speak. So I'll be happy to see that rolls out as the season kicks off. Yeah, thank you. And, and Charlie and his team have uh, developed some specific um, activities relating to paramutuals so that we can educate folks there um, and, and specifically on racing. Um, and then we have some other ideas up our sleeves that we're not quite ready to share yet, but hopefully uh, in June we will. All right, great. Thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank great. You. Great. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for this presentation. It was excellent, and I learned something new every time. A couple of observations, things that I thought were impressive. Um, Mark always talks about keeping it fresh. And I did hear some really interesting uh, new aspects that I do think keep this whole program fresh. One of them was, um, I mean, Charlie was giving us the whole, uh, the quizzes that were done. Um, you know, I, I was impressed that you had one on March Madness, sports betting. So you're, you're also preparing your own team, educating your own team so that responsible gaming will be seamless once, if in fact that becomes a legal in Massachusetts. I thought that was impressive. Um, I also, uh, as uh, Commissioner O'Brien pointed out, love that you've made such an effort with the racing side of the house. I loved uh, Let Game Sense Be Your Running Mate and um, having a, a physical presence at the big events, I think will be really, um, a really good thing to really educate those folks on the racing side of the house because it isn't it's typically a different group of gamblers than it is on the casino side of the house so i think that effort was really um, something i enjoyed hearing about also i look forward to in june uh hearing more about the live chat and the geofencing uh, i'm wondering if the live chat will be something that is much more attractive to younger people i know you don't have data yet but uh that may be something that uh, some folks feel more comfortable with. So, um, excellent presentation. Thank you for keeping it fresh and the way you all present and, and make this such an important service for our, our gamblers here in Massachusetts. So much. Thank you, Commissioner Zinega. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I picked up on a couple of the, the 
the points that um, that Commissioner Cameron was also making. Uh, I think the geofencing is fantastic. I look forward to uh, getting to know a little bit more about what uh, uh, the live chat, um, you know, um, ends up working relative to the next progression, right? If somebody really engages, does that mean they go and have a face-to-face? -face? So could it be a referral or a or a, some kind of uh, um, you know, referral to the, the helpline or the, uh, the safer gaming educational line, which which name I, I like very much, by the way. So um, I also uh, think your your uh, your theme of outreach, um, given the pandemic, is is really good. It's a it's a great overview of being creative and active, and I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, I think there's also a theme of collaboration that emerges from your overall presentation in, in the, from the likes of the, the casino employees, of course, but, uh, but many others and in your staff and as well. So um, I um, let me mention one thing that I also look forward to um, that, uh, that you mentioned at the end, and that's the Play My Way rollout. Um, Mark and our staff knows this, but let me mention it here. Uh, one of the things that we learned actually from the Games Sense Advisors of the PPC example uh, was that some customers really didn't like those early notifications. And, and I know we've worked, we worked towards, they, they really just like the actual notification, uh, not the ones prior to. And I know we're working towards uh, perhaps configuring, making the, the, the MGC, uh, MGM, sorry, a version be configurable so that people could choose whether to get early notifications or not. And I know that that's usually a, a it's tricky because the more you, uh, the, the more choices or, or uh, uh, things that you have to choose about uh, uh, the, the, the tool, the more likely that somebody might just decide not to, you know, sign yeah. up anyway. It needs to be something quicker or, or or people don't sign up. So, um, as as the only point is, uh, as we continue to learn through you, GameSense advisors and GameSense program, how people are engaging with Play My Way, and some of the feedback they've had in the past, um, it's a little bit anecdotally uh, anecdotal, but very powerful. You really are an important voice at the table in helping us roll it out early on. So I'm I'm, I'm happy that you're excited about it because you're the ones who are going to make us, uh, I think, um, uh, successful uh, in that role. Great. Um, I also have a, a few observations. Great presentation, Odessa and Charlie. Thank you so much, and congratulations to. The, um, those in, individuals who were singled out for the excellence awards. Um, each of the uh, general managers at the properties are aware of that recognition and, and we're excited to make it public. I like that this is uh, part of the presentation and hope that that will be part of the presentation going forward, uh, Mark. Um, VSE expansion, wonderful, and uh, you know, the community outreach uh, particularly now is so critical, but I hope that we can continue to uh, build the capacity, Odessa, that you described. Uh, I, I like that you heard the need and you, you figured out a way to respond and uh, con congratulations on that. Um, a couple uh, uh, takeaways from the day that we saw. Um, right off the bat, Chelsea, you explained how there is uh, evidence of increase in, in the interactions um, some were the simple interactions, and then, of course, the more complex ones. I, I credit, as Mark indicated earlier, the, um, the role that GameSense advisors have had to assume in light of uh, the pandemic, in that it, it was more difficult, more challenging. One, um, you do bank on, on personal interactions and those smiles, and so the fact that you could get through the masks and those those new barriers is so important. So thank you, thank you for your own willingness to do that in light of the, the health issues. I also think that besides the benefit you've provided you know, for maybe um, responsible gambling purposes, there probably was also an opportunity for um, 
providing some relief to the isolation that so many people in Massachusetts have been experiencing. So those simple interactions were probably in many ways uh, a chance for those who have been isolated during this time. So thank you for that too. I'm, I'm presuming that um, <clears throat> at least with respect to the simple interactions, I bet there's a lot of benefit on that front. Finally, I also just wanted to mention that, <clears throat> you know, it should be stressed that the Game Sense advisors are providing not only that key um, interaction at times of stress for the patrons who are, um, need help being able to make um, informed, healthy choices around gaming, but you also do provide an opportunity for the patrons to understand the games, and you do it with your humor and your, your humanity so that they um, you know how the games actually work and and and, and the rules of the game um, and then you you know today Charlie emphasized how it really is a collaboration you know North is here with the, the um, all the individuals who are on the gaming floor that it's a collaboration with security members and it's it's truly um, an, an opportunity to make sure patrons are informed about healthy choices and how the games work. These on-site advisors were, are mandated by legislation. And you know, they're fulfilling that critical role of um, helping folks make healthy choices, informed choices, and, uh, and, and understand um, the, the nature of casino play here in Massachusetts. So it's, um, and it's, you're doing it with fewer hands, which we understand as well, so thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Zinnika, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'll say I wasn't no, sure. No, I think that's all said. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much and, uh, and thank you again uh, for the, uh, the presentation and in your good work. Chelsea? Just thank, thank you all. You guys are always so kind to us and you make us want to come back and, and showcase our efforts. So it can always be intimidating speaking in front of a, a large group, but um, you always make us feel welcome and, and we appreciate it and, and, and all, of your, all of your good work. So um, you're fantastic partners to us, Teresa and Mark, I couldn't say enough good things about and we really appreciate everything. Thank you, thanks. Then moving on, we're all set. Okay, moving on then to um, um, our item number five, Communities of Dares Division, Joe Delaney, uh, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Community Mitigation Fund. Um, so today, before you, we'll have three, we'll be reviewing three 2021 Community Mitigation Fund applications. Uh, now that this is our first uh, meeting of the year on this, I would just like to spend a couple of minutes uh, going over our process just a little bit. So first, I'd like to recognize the review team for this year's program, which includes uh, Commissioner Enrique Zuniga, uh, Senior Enforcement Counsel Kate Muxy hardigan uh, Associate General Counsel Carrie Teresi, uh, Director of Diversity and Legislative Affairs Jill Griffin, Workforce Program Manager Crystal Howard, Program Manager of Research and Responsible Gaming Teresa Fiore, Administrative Assistant Tanya Perez, and last but cert not, certainly not least, uh, Program Manager Mary Thurlow. So the review team has provided recommendations on this year's application for your review and your packet. Uh, we are making these recommendations after a very thorough review, which involved numerous meetings of the review team, a public comment process, um, outreach to the licensees, and submission of written responses uh, to review team questions. And as we've talked about recently, our process has changed somewhat this year in that we are bringing grant applications to the commission for review and approval as we complete the review of each application, uh, rather than bringing them to the commission at one or two large meetings uh, to help uh, both streamline the process and try to even out the workflow a little bit. So before you today are three uh, community mitigation fund applications. Uh, two of them are workforce and one of them is a community planning application. 
Now we included this uh, community planning application with the workforce because it is, it's actually for the de development of curriculum, which will eventually be used in workforce training programs. So we felt that they were sufficiently similar to sort to of be reviewed together as a package, even though they do fall technically under two different categories. Um, so our 21, 2021 target for spending on the workforce grant in the guidelines was $800,000. And so what you see before you today, um, the applications that we received uh, totaled only $700,000, which we are recommending for award. Um, now, since there are these extra funds available and we know the good work that these programs uh, do, we will also be asking that the commission authorize an award of an additional $50,000 to each of these applicants should they be able to either expand the programs identified in their applications or identify other eligible programs that would benefit from funding. And what we are at this, what we're asking is that you, know, you authorize staff to review and approve this additional funding uh, with the provision that will keep the commission apprised of any expansion of funding. You know, the thought here basically is that um, once the applications are approved by the commission, there's a, a, you know, a bit of a bureaucratic process that we need to go through to award these. We have to do contract documents and um, ISAs and, and the grant documents themselves. And the thought was that between now and when those are executed, we could talk to the grantees and see if there are, if there are any opportunities in this area. And if there aren't, well, so be it. But if there are, we think it would be great um, to expend the funds that we have available for the program. Um, so unless there are any particular questions on that, I'm going to turn it over to Jill Griffin and Crystal Howard uh, to present the details of each application. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair and Commissioners. Um, as Jill mentioned, I'm joined by Crystal Howard, Program Manager, um, who stands ready to answer any questions you might have. Um, but I'd like to just start with um, setting the context um, before we review these three um, grant proposals. Um, and I just start by saying that these workforce development investments are more important now than ever before. Um, you'll remember, it's probably quite fresh in your mind, we were faced with a very different picture when we reviewed the grants last year. The leisure and hospitality industry was one of the hardest hit industries nationally, losing more than 7.7 .7 million jobs or 47% of total positions. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, from May 2019 to May 2020, Massachusetts was one of the hardest hit. Leisure and hospitality employment decreased almost 60%. Um, hotels in the Boston area alone were hit harder by the coronavirus pandemic than just about any other major U.S. city. Hotel industry officials indicate that recovery could take years. Um, the industry says that there are still more than 8,000 people out of work in greater Boston alone. Um, the good news is we are starting to see this sector slowly rebound, just as we see the casinos begin to hire again. Um, but as I started, these investments are more important now than ever before. Um, I'm going to review the proposals, but I'm going to highlight some of the newer elements because um, most of the proposals um, are very similar um, to the proposals you've seen in years past, um, as these applicants seem to be building on their strong, strong work from previous years. So the first one, um, Holyoke Community College, again partners with Springfield Technical Community College and Springfield Public Schools, offering a, a continuum of adult basic education, career readiness, and occupational training to meet the needs of both MGM and the region. Um, 
um, Holyoke Community College is bringing back their culinary training, which was eliminated last year due to the pandemic. They plan to train 50 students to meet the needs of MGM and the region. Enhanced components include a new focus on online job interviewing and um, English as a second language culinary classes. Um, Springfield Technical Community College, uh, one of the partners, will continue emphasizing job readiness, entry level skills development, increased reading, comprehensive comprehension, and math skills. The new component of their program is that they are this year offering guest services gold certification in addition to their OSHA, CPR, and first aid certificates. Um, and then Springfield Public Schools um, continues advancing students through adult basic education, including um, English classes and, and uh, high school equivalency courses. They have a new emphasis on technology and did it digital literacy. Um, their curriculum enhancements include survey of hospitality careers course in collaboration with both MGM and the Greater Springfield Convention and Visitors Bureau. So the review team felt that this was a very strong application and recommends full funding of $350,000 which includes 100,000 to each of the three partners and a $50,000 um, supplemental award of $50,000 for regional collaboration. And um, this is even um, though the applicant only requested $42,551 for the um, supplemental award, um, it, as you note in our memo, we thought that um, additional funding for uh, marketing um, would be well utilized. Um, so given that the um, workforce grant applications total less than the targeted amount, we also ask that the commission authorize an award of up to 400,000 as um, director, uh, um, uh, Delaney mentioned, um, and um, should eligible work be identified by the applicant and commission staff. Staff will keep the commission updated on these proposed use of additional funds. So I think I'll pause at that point. And Questions or, or comments for Director Griffin on this? I, I did. Um, sure. Dr. Griffin, have you had communications with the applicant in terms of ideas for marketing? I mean, it, I, I'm not opposed to the idea of giving them extra given the need to sort of get going again, given the last year, but I'm just curious if you've already had those conversations with them about whether they have ideas for putting that money to use. Um, we've had, um, we've had uh, communication in the past um, and also with MGM um, and both entities generally um, value and um, discuss the need for additional marketing. Um, so I think um, this funding would be well served. But there, it sounds like there hasn't been anything specific to the upcoming year, is that right? Um, we would certainly um, um, have conversations about specific marketing uses for the grant um, as part of the um, process. Okay. And I just add, Jill, um, so we've had brief discussions with them on this and in the situation from last year where they had proposed this marketing element, we talked to them then and of course that was completely cut. Um, with primarily a lot of that marketing intent goes to programming the culinary school but also um, some of these students who are coming in are unaware in the region of the various positions that this grant allows them to get through. And so they, they try to target the, the marketing as more of a recruitment strategy in order to put them into the right place in the pipeline. But they use all three schools as the primary 
place where they go and do a lot of this recruitment. They have other ideas that they've never been able to in implement because they didn't have marketing funding in the past. So when they came in last year with the um, regional collaboration proposal, it included a much larger chunk for marketing and they had specific ideas then that weren't um, put into motion because of the pandemic. So I think we'd revisit what those ideas would be and, and write into the grant what the marketing strategy would be. Okay. Um, and then we can maybe table this for a discussion at the end, but in terms of the request for the sort of the leeway and discretion to do the extra 50,000, I just think maybe we can have a conversation about how that fits in once we've gone through all of the applications. I think it's, I mean, I think it's a great program, you know, but I, I think I'll table that comment until the end. Okay, so um, I want to make sure I understand you'd like to address the additional funding as kind of a separate matter. So let's think about that when we when we move forward. Um, I think that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, I, I do have just a technical issue. If the 50,000 weren't granted, um, Chief Delaney, um, through a, a, a vote today as recommended, if it weren't, does it revert or where does it go? Um, how would it be accessed in, or could it be accessed in another way? Well, the money would just roll over. You know, so if we awarded 700,000, we get 800,000 available, that money would just roll over to the next year. Um, so the thought was if we have it available and given, you know, how much they had to cut last year with the pandemic and other things that, you know, there, there probably are good uses out there, um, you know, and our thought was, hey, if we could just have that leeway to do that, we could see if they want to avail themselves of it and have any ideas, um, we would do that. And if not, then, you know, the money would roll over. And, and just to clarify, am I right that the, the logic of attaching the $50,000 is because we probably we prioritize and value the regional collaboration. Is that the link to the 50,000? Or is it simply because we have it available? Is there? Well, I think it's it's a little bit of both. I mean, so each each um, of the applications got the $50,000 for the regional collaboration. That was sort of the bonus that they get. Um, and, um, you know, we were looking at it and, you know, the demand this year is down somewhat for uh, community mitigation funds and we thought since the money is available um, if we can work with them to try to expand you know what good work these programs do you know so yeah. you thought if there's a way to expand them and and they have the capability to do that this would be a good opportunity to do it you know we certainly don't need to do it um, it just seemed to us to be a good idea that with having the funds available if we could expand these get a few more people trained you know as the especially as the uh, facilities start um, hiring more workers and so on, um, it, this would just be a good thing. Thank you, I didn't mean to um, go out of line. Commissioner Zunica, you, do you have a question now or comment? And, well, I was gonna comment on, on, on that question, but I think Joe uh, addressed it. I think context here is the, the critical part, which is on the overall guidelines, we had, um, uh, anticipated a level of, of, of expenditure and requests that just came lower than that what you know when, when they submitted their application. So in that context, it's, it's, it's this recommendation to to have a little bit more leeway. Um, there are other larger questions that I think we could address at a later time, uh, relative to guidelines, for example, for future years, as to whether some of those limits that we have placed and maybe limits. Is, is the wrong word. Some of what we have issued as, gu as guideline needs to be perhaps rethought without a number or with a higher number given what we're seeing. Um, so, but I, but I think uh, um, addressing it either way um, is, is, um, is good for us now or later. And I just think just to add in the one other consideration there is it was, as we were talking about it, the review team originally thought well, why don't we go back to these folks and see if they want to revise their application and add some stuff in now and so on and so forth. And the thought was, well, rather than delaying the approval of their underlying application, let's get that moving. 
and we can have these, and if the commission is okay with authorizing an additional 50,000 uh, per applicant, we can have these conversations, um, you know, like I said, while we're doing all the paperwork that we need to do to get done, you know, they still need to put together final scopes and timelines and so on and so forth, um, you know, based on the approvals. As a reminder, they could have come in with either the 50,000 supplemental bonus or the 100,000 supplemental bonus, and they both only came in with 50,000 HCC actually coming in under with their request, which is why we bumped it up a little bit. But so these applications could have been um, 50,000 more to begin with. The request. And just to follow up on the chair's comment, procedurally speaking, I'm assuming that absent us making that finding with the extra 50,000 in it today, there's no mechanism for them to then come back in front of us and move to adjust an increase. Is that why you're recommending that we do it today? Yeah, you know, typically we we just, um, you know, we don't usually come back unless there's a real, um, you know, occasionally there's a modification to an application. They either want to repurpose some money for something else and then we come back. But we haven't come back before to actually increase the value. So I think, yeah, the thought was let's, let's, see see what the appetite of the commission is to do this and if it's there we do it now and if not you know we look we can revisit it if we if we want to you know if there's um you know we could go back to them and say all right we're, we're you're approved for 350 um there's some additional money that's available there and if you want to come back with another proposal we could bring that in front of the commission i mean there's a number of ways that we could do it we thought here is that if the commission could just give us the authority to to work with them to come up with a scope that fits within our guidelines, that would make some sense. Just you know, to avoid you know multiple uh, stops in front of the commission and so on. But there wouldn't be a procedural bar then. If we said three fifty, there wouldn't be anything stopping them from coming back with a plan that says, well, now we want forty eight or fifty more. Yeah, no, and I think it's we we would approach them after you know if you didn't approve that today we would we would approach them and say hey here there's an opportunity there what do you guys think mm -hmm. and and if you're interested come back with us with something and then we can bring that back in front of the commission right okay commissioner cameron yeah joe it sounds like you didn't want to the timing is such that you want to let them know that they are going to be approved and they can start their planning and training and whatnot right yeah, we just didn't want to slow down the process. That was really, you know, the notion was let's get this thing moving and get it, get it going. And, um, you know, these workforce grants are typically ones they take a little bit longer than the others because we have ISAs and other things that we have to deal with. Um, so the thought was let's get these out of the chute and get them going. And um, if we can, if we can add more into it, that's great. And if not, that's fine too. Can I ask a technical? Question, do our guidelines, our, our regs, or our, our statute, um, and also just general, you know, I don't know if it's procurement rules, is, does, is there any concern about um, uh, releasing the 50,000 if it hasn't been requested? I, I don't believe, um statutorily that there's there's uh, you know anything that would preclude us from doing that um, in in terms of I, I think that the statute and our guidelines what what's very clear is about a deadline for the February 1st deadline right yeah the first deadline okay, for, that, for that, that I remembered I was thinking the yeah. same way uh, I'm but don't just... we also have a functional didn't we also have a functional rule where staff would have the authority to sort of change the uh, allocation of funds if it fell below a certain threshold. My hesitation with that $50,000 request, while I understand the sentiment, um, I felt like we'd all sort of come to a consensus that any, anything under a certain threshold could be dealt with quickly without coming back and just informing the commission as opposed to seeking authorization. My, my hesitancy with the $50,000 where they don't have a plan yet is it does seem to be in contravention of the agreement we had before which is over a certain amount, and I, I believe 50 would be there. It just is running afoul of how we've done stuff historically. Yeah, you, you're correct on that. That's, you know, we had, we had always done it as sort of 10%, I think, of, of the number. Yeah, um, 10%. 10%. And, right. But, but the, um, 
the February 1st would not apply here because you're no, just doesn't. really going back to ask for additional information, say, on a marketing. So that would not preclude us um, from eventually, if we think it's relevant, approving this additional 50,000, right. correct? Yep. So, so no, maybe the cleanest no. way is to approve what they have in front of us now and then um, you know, you do your work behind the scenes with them and then we get a second approval. Right. Sure, that's, that works fine that way. Yeah, I mean, I and by the way, um, the, by the way, um, we also included in the guidelines this year for the first time, the ability to come in at, a, at any time in the year with, with, more, um, with more requests. That's, you know, we, we, that's we, what I'm satisfied with February 1st, you mean? Right, right. right. So there was, again, Commissioner O'Brien? I think once you've satisfied the February 1st hard cutoff, you can almost move move to amend, so to speak, if, if circumstances change, you have the ability to come back and harken back to that deadline. And this yep. was the singular applicant for workforce, correct? Well, there's two. There's no, two. there's, well, there's a, more. <laughs> Wait, I'm so, there, no, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is actually really, um, this is the first. This is, for, this is the first one for workforce well, I know that there's the Boston one, but for the Western, were there any other? Oh, for no. the Western Mass, it's the only one, yes. Right, right, okay. Um, and, and we have, um, under our program, Region A and Region B, slice them in half. But I wanted to make sure there's no other applicant that would be competing for the funds down the road. No. For workforce, nope. and it's my understanding that we don't, if, if the uh, full amount were not awarded today and there's a $50,000 balance or $100,000 balance, they wouldn't go back into the fund for the entire applicant pool, correct? We would still keep it in the silos of workforce development and transportation and plan. Um, no, it would, it would just stay within the region. Oh. So in the next year, whatever, whatever funds roll over from the previous year, go into you know whatever we determine the guidelines to be for the next year if we look if we wanted to increase workforce from 800,000 to a million or uh, you know the, the target we can do that that's all a matter of the policy discussions that we get into you know in the fall when we're developing guidelines for 22. So now I'm going to ask the more complicated question if the, let's just say there's a balance from you know in each of our, our silos right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you can probably finish the sentence better than me. Um, you're nodding your head. Right. If something more tantalizing comes up in another category, would you take the money left in the silos, pool it, and potentially give it to someone outside workforce development? Is that something that's allowed under the guidelines? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the so funds are all going to All the more reason, I think, to sort of keep it where it is, since we don't have a plan yet. I hate to commit that money and then find out someone in another category came in and said, I can take 75 out in Western Mass and do A, and, and we've already committed it to this other program that hasn't come up with a plan yet. Well, what I can tell you is that for this year, that would never be the case. We, well, are within, we are within our targets for all of our categories. So okay. that was one of the reasons why we were saying, hey, we have this money here. Why don't we see if we can use it this year rather than just letting it roll over and winding up wherever it may wind up in. With that said, I, I think maybe it makes sense that um, given the threshold question that of the 10% and the fact that this all goes back into a pool, um, that we maybe defer the 50,000 until there's, we have more information on how it will actually be spent. I don't know, that's my thinking. Um, although I appreciate, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm a little uncomfortable uh, yeah. um, I, with the I, idea of giving I, funds I, I, away I, without a plan. Um, I think that's very fair, I, even though I was, you know, ori originally open to the idea of, of spending the, you know, everything we had, quote unquote, budgeted for the category. Um, I think that's fair. We could, and I, and I think the most important part is to, to look at the request, which, which as Joe has mentioned, um, you know, it takes a little while to execute those ISAs and get them going, make sure there's no interruption in their programs, because this is a program they have 
from the Especially if the 50,000 um, can be rolled over to next year, you know, that's right. another 50,000 for maybe a different proposal. Commissioner right. Cameron, you're nodding your head. Are you? Yes, you precedent is important and we don't want any under, unintended consequences here. So okay. I, I do believe it's cleaner to uh, address the matter, the, the secondary matter, the marketing after we have a plan. Yeah, so what we can do is, um, assuming that you approve the uh, sort of underlying amounts, um, we can, uh, you know, once once that's voted, we can know, you know, we can get with the grantees and, and let them know that, hey, we do have, you know, additional funds in the categories. And if you want to avail yourself of those funds, um, why don't you see if you can rework your budget or, you know, give us a supplemental budget for those amounts. And then we can bring them back to the commission, you know, hopefully in the same time frame that we're dealing with now for the rest of the community mitigation fund. So before we just completely, I, I don't want to derail the, the good conversation around the, the application. Um, and, and perhaps, I don't know, Commissioner Cameron, if you wanted to just comment on the, the $300,000 um, um, request or the funding of the $300,000 under, dollar underlying um, this application or supporting this application. Yeah, I am very supportive of the application. I've seen the good work done by the institutions out there and the training programs have been just tremendous. So I, I very much have been supporting the original application for the additional training and you know to get these young folks trained and job ready. Just to clarify, um, Chair Judd Stein, um, the um, regional collaboration was part of the application um, and guidelines. So I was going to add that, Dale. It's part of the original funding. So the as, as we've done that Joe was mentioning is separate from that marketing and 42, Jill, you have the number in front of you, probably the 41, 42,000 that they had requested. So that's yeah, not, so the supplemental award is part of the workforce grant. Right. So they, they each of our applicants asked for three hundred thousand dollar base, and uh, in Region A they asked for the full fifty. What they were supposed to do was ask for either fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar bonus. Right. And for some and reason Holyoke came in with this oddball forty two thousand five hundred fifty one number. It's supposed to be fifty or a hundred. Sure. So no. we read their application and said, well, we think they should get the bonus. Which should be fifty thousand. So we rounded it to the fifty grand. That's really and that's and not, that's wholly distinct from the fifty that we just talked about yeah, that we're going to exactly. table. And so really, the request in front of us is rounding up the three forty two and change to three fifty. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're voting. I on. saw that. I saw yes. that. Yeah. Thank you for. I saw that number and and did jump right to the three fifty because that's what the yeah, the plan was. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, I, I just want to remark before I go on to my fellow commissioners that I, I appreciate uh, Director Griffin uh, reminding us of the backdrop of um, how COVID has really hit, um, um, particularly the Boston area, but we know, of course, Western Mass, entire Commonwealth in terms of the hospitality industry. So this, this is really um, a, a great investment and a critical one. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, did you just want to remark on the, the um, uh, original application? No, certainly I'll reiterate. I want to make sure that I, my comments didn't get lost in my first comments on this. But no, I do. I remember going out looking at the program one of the last times that I was able to go out there. Um, it's very impressive. I absolutely think the underlying request is is very important and very valid. Great. Commissioner Zuniga, I know you were involved too, of course, as part of the review. Yeah, same here. Even though it might be tempting to think, well, there were a lot of job losses. Um, in the past, so there may be some capacity out there. There is evidence that uh, a lot of people change uh, professions perhaps during these times. There's always a need perhaps uh, of more training. There's a lot of mobility. So as, as Jill and Crystal and Joe has, have already said, you know, these become um, more important during times like this where there's a lot of re-entry um, into the workforce and that's why a lot of the recommendation. Any further questions for Director Griffin um, or for Crystal? No. 
Uh, so, Madam Chair, we have we have um, motions for each of these. I don't know yeah, if you wanted to we, take them we, up one yeah. by one or at the yeah. end. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to move on this um, exactly. Uh, if uh, we do need a vote, yeah. so we'll. I think it makes sense. Well, um, it's fresh in our mind to to uh, move on this if if a commissioner is prepared to do so. Commissioner O'Brien. Certainly, uh, Madam Chair. I move that the commission approve the award of a workforce grant in the amount of $350,000 to Holyoke Community College in conjunction with Springfield Technical Community College and the City of Springfield Public School Department for adult education, career readiness, and occupational training as described in the community fund analysis memo included in the commissioner's packet and is discussed here today. And the commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating the award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes. Four zero, Vivian. Thank you. All right, then, uh, Director Griffin, if you want to move on to Region A, please. Sure. So Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board and the City of Boston and a consortium of community partners um, will provide career and employment services, ESOL, digital literacy trainings, targeted at hospitality industry workers who have been impacted by the COVID-19 economic downturn. Um, and the proposal to focus explicitly on 1,000 um, hospitality workers who have been impacted by the pandemic is um, a new um, focus for this um, um, grant partnership. Um, this um, grant entity is regional. Um, they propose to integrate a sequence of services, skills development, um, and reemployment services. They hope to connect people to unemployment, um, supplemental nutritional assistance programs, and housing security. A new, another new focus is the expansion of di digital literacy training through North Star Digital Literacy Curriculum. Um, and that will be expanded for use in Chelsea, Revere, and in Everett, as well as Malden. Um, the, this um, applicant also requests $50,000 for supplemental funding um, for regional collaboration. And this would be allocated to the local career advisor organizations to focus on the needs of the hospitality sector. Um, so the review team supports the continuation of this successful workforce program and recommends full funding of this grant request, um, including the supplemental award of $50,000 for a total of $350,000. Questions, comments? I, so in this case, again, the supplemental is not, um, that is part of the, uh, because it's a uh, collaboration. Regional. Yep. Yep. That's right. Original perfect. request. Thank you. Part of the guidelines. Part of the guidelines, thank you. Um, I just want to know, uh, for, for those who may not be reading along on the memorandum, um, always, uh, we get a licensee response to, and of course, both licensees um, in Region A and in Region B are, are supporting these recommendations. Any questions? Strong application, thank you. Um, then without any questions, do I have a motion with respect to the Region A application? Um, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to move um, that the, um, the Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board and the City of Boston, uh, I move that the Commission approve the award of the workforce grant in the amount of $350,000 to the Mass 
hire Metro North Workforce and the City of Boston for the Career and Employment Services English for speakers um, of other languages in the digital literacy training as described in the Community Mediation Fund analysis memo included in the Commissioner's packet and as discussed here today. And that uh, Commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument uh, commemorating the award in accordance with 205 CMR 15304. Second. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Sinica. Aye. And I vote yes. Four zero, Vivian. Thank you so much. Really great work. Um, Joe, do you have anything you want to add? No. We have one more. We have one more. Oh. Um, we, Chelsea, that's funny because I I um I scrolled down. I have to say I've got a I I don't I missed it last night. So I'm. So we well, have a community planning grant. Oh, um, I did see that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I overscrolled. Thank you. Go ahead, Jill. All right. So the cities of Chelsea and Revere submitted um, a request for ninety-seven thousand five hundred. Uh, dollars in funding that will allow them to commission a consultant to develop curriculum aimed at English for speakers of other languages and adult digital literacy programs, which are contextualized across four pathways, including hospitality, logistics, healthcare, and IT. The proposal states that such curricula design would aid the casino in meeting its workforce commitments in the future, especially in the surrounding communities, um, and ensure the local economic impact of the casino reaches its full potential. The applicants intend for the workforce curricula to address the employment pipelines both into and out of the casino due to the pandemic, resulting in the casino um, Due to, uh, resulting in the casino not being able to return to full employment at this point. The review team recommends full funding of this planning grant in the amount of $97,500 with the condition that the applicant work to strengthen the implementation plan as the curricular development comes to fruition and communicates that with uh, commission staff. Questions for Director Griffin on this grant. Chelsea Revere co um, collaboration. Uh, can I ask how, uh, how that condition will actually be implemented? Will they get the full funding or just partial release of funds? Um, the funding is um, for the development of the um, curriculum. Um, we want to just ensure that um, it doesn't sit on a shelf somewhere. They, they have provided us information with um, community partners that they hope to um, hope will implement the grant. So I think a meeting with staff um, with further development um, and information about conversations and that sort of thing should be sufficient. Yeah, we we will put actually a condition in the grant document that that will require them to to meet with us along the way and submit information to us to just to again as Jill said we just want to make sure that that this really gets implemented and um, you know they did identify a bunch of groups that they want to work with and so on but you know they are not there yet until they start developing this and working with those folks but we just again we just want to make sure that. It, um, it doesn't sit on a shelf somewhere. And you know, with respect to funding, we, we generally give out the money in sort of three tranches. We give them 25% up front to start the development. And once that's spent, we give them 50. And then we sort of hold the last 25% till we get our final deliverables. So it's sort of at that point where we would, um, you know, through the process, we would follow up on that. But that's where we would sort of have our ultimate uh, uh, hammer. To, to, to make sure that that gets done is the, 
is the final funding. Right, that was really helpful, uh, Joe, for me to understand. And then the other, the other point is that this is a community planning grant. So this is coming from a different, a different bucket. It just yeah. happens to be workforce drill. And we don't have to be concerned about the fact, because we are doing this a little bit differently this year, right? We're doing it over a series. We don't have to worry about the fact that we're now you know, possibly going to do a $97,000 grant and have others, because I understand there's a surplus for dollars in any case. Yeah, the, under the community under community planning, we have we have sufficient funds within that category um, to fund the projects that have come in. So um, again, it doesn't. I mean, look, if if we were oversubscribed by a hundred percent, we probably wouldn't be able to do it this way. But I see. Yeah. But the case is that we're not. So so we can. Yeah. Okay. So we understand that that's um, because of just this particular situation this year. All right. Any questions for the questions? I love the collaboration. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Zinka. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the award of a community planning grant in the amount of $97,500 to the city of Chelsea and Revere, to the cities of Chelsea and Revere, for curriculum development of contextualized English for speakers of other language programs and adult digital literacy classes. Subject to the condition that the applicant work with, work to strengthen the application plan as described in the memo, included in the commissioner's packet, and as discussed here today. And I further move that the commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating the award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.0. Second. Thank you. Now for the discussion, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinnica. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you. Now, thank you, um, uh, Director Griffin and, and Crystal Howard. And uh, Chief Delaney, anything further at this time? Um, no, I think just, you know, we will. We will continue to follow up, um, you know, on on the extra fifty thousand with the applicants and see if they're they're interested in that, and and we'll, you know, certainly come back if that is the case. Real, really helpful. Thanks. Uh, think that we'll all feel comfortable with that process. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you. Um, thank you. And then we're looking forward to the next our next meeting where you'll be doing another. Uh, Good, good number of applications on public safety, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we look. It looks like we're going to have at least seven and possibly eight uh, for that meeting. Yeah. So for timekeeping, Karen, that's important. All righty. Um, now we're we're back to racing again. Um, Dr. Lightbound. Um, good afternoon. Um, today I'm joined with Mindy Coleman, counsel for the Jockey Guild, and we're here to discuss. Mass General Law Chapter 128A, Section 5H4, which talks about how um, monies that come from the betting handle, license fees, daily assessment, things like that, are to be distributed. So this is not money that comes from the Racehorse Development Fund under 23K, Section 60, just to um, make sure that everybody's aware that there's that this is where the money's coming from. Um, to paraphrase it, it talks about $65,000 going to the group representing the majority of jockeys for health and welfare benefits. At the February 25th meeting, the commission decided um, that the Jockey Guild was the group representing the jockeys, and they directed uh, Council Coleman and I to um, go back and look at the qualifications um, in um, light of there being no racing at Suffolk Downs last year and the decrease in number of race days um, in previous years. Uh, we looked at the um, different, there's uh, three different categories of jockeys that are included in this. Um, one is active, the other is disabled, and the other is retired. So looking at the, um, trying to determine qualifications for the active jockeys, uh, we weren't able to determine them um, due to the lack of racing last year and the decrease. So we went on and looked at um, the qualifications for disabled jockeys 
and felt that no changes need to be made to this category. So the qualifications that are in your packet are the same as the, pack, as the qualifications that have been in place. Um, looking at the qualifications for retired jockeys, it was felt that some decreases in the number of mounts were required to uh, reflect the decreased amount of availability of racing um, uh, possibilities um, since there were less opportunities to race. Um, doing um, a rough estimate, um, Ms. Coleman figured that about uh, 17 jockeys would qualify under these two categories and um, distributing the 65,000 among them would uh, mean that they would each get approximately $3,823. Um, I don't have any objections to these um, qualifications and I do want to thank the Jockey Guild and Mindy for their work on this. Um, they put considerable time and effort into trying to determine what would be fair. And um, if you, the commission has any questions, um, we're both uh, here for questions. Good afternoon, Mindy. Thank you for your good work with Dr. Lightbound. Nice to see you again. Uh, commissioners, commissioners, do you have questions or comments? Commissioner Cameron, do you want to lead? Uh, sure. I did have um, an opportunity to discuss this matter before this meeting, so I did um, have a thorough understanding of why the decisions were made the way they are, and I'm, I'm in agreement, but I didn't know if Attorney Coleman had anything to add about um, not being able to determine current racers. There is no racing in Massachusetts. That's the point that struck out to me, uh, stuck out rather, and um, and I and certainly agree with the less mounts because of the current situation. But is there anything that you could add to that, uh, Attorney Coleman? I do think, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and for reviewing this uh, matter with us. The retired jockeys, as uh, Executive Lightbound had, Dr. Lightbound had pointed out, that was because over the last period of time, it's decreased even though what we had had originally. Um, as far as the actives, we had tried to go back and see if there were individuals who still had their permanent residence in Massachusetts. And when we had done so, that number had even decreased and I think they've been forced to move out and move to other areas and relocate because of racing. Um, but the importance of keeping this money for the retired and or permanently disabled, and the reason I, I reiterate that is these individuals, the individuals that were permanently disabled, they were disabled at Massachusetts racetracks during Massachusetts racing. Um, and then the retired members, these are individuals, even with the numbers and the reduction of, of numbers that have still contributed or, or uh, participated a significant number or a significant portion of their life has been in Massachusetts racing. They were uh, major factors in Massachusetts racing for many, many years. So I think it's important that we do what we can to assist those individuals and continue to assist those individuals because they, they've kind of relied on some of this money. Um, and again, the $3,823 is a uh, pro rata share of the full 65,000. The guild does not take any of that money for anybody else. That goes back to these 17 individuals that we have, that would qualify based under these presented qualifications. Thank you, that's really helpful and it gives um, the, the detailed work that Dr. Leipon mentioned that you have done is, is really clear now. So that's really helpful and thank you for the work. Thank you. Commissioner Zunica, any comments or questions? No, really, um, uh, really helpful as well from the comments and from the materials and the briefing uh, beforehand. I'm on board with this, um, uh, with this plan. Um, I know perhaps that there's a technical question as to whether we need to approve this, given that we have not been, uh, we have not approved plans like this in the past, but um, I'm happy to learn that uh, this is what's being done and, um, and uh, hear Ms. Coleman outline on those, um, those plans. Sean O'Brien, with your cat. Hi, Mango. Yeah, who's not letting go. Um, <laughs> put him down and he's dug in. Um, just to reiterate what um, Commissioner Cameron Zuniga said, I, I benefited from the, the materials and from the discussion for 
um, with Dr. Lifebound, and I do, I appreciate the work and the thoughtfulness that went into sort of parsing all of these categories out. And I, I'm, I'm satisfied with what's been put before us. And I, I thank you for your work, Attorney Coleman. I know it was a lot of um, minutiae to go through, but I think it was necessary. I think it was a good effort. I appreciate you sharing your cat with us on those yeah. journeys. It's always People nice. People work here are very familiar with him. <laughs> Every once in a while, he chimes in. Yeah. Um, so, Just so you again, know, he tried jumping on the table and couldn't quite make it. He misjudged, so <laughs> <laughs> he's a little reassurance right now. <laughs> yeah, um, Mindy, uh, uh, Attorney Coleman, thanks. Thank you again for uh, the, the detailed work. And, and as everybody has said, we, we had the benefit of, of meeting with Dr. Lightbound. And I um, actually met also with, with Todd and um, you know, uh, Karen on this matter. Um, looking through the statute, I, I believe that we've concluded that a, a, a that the commission does not um, need to act formally on this matter. Um, we do have Dr. Lightbound's uh, um, good judgment here that she has uh, indicated no no concerns and raises no objections to the um, the outcome of the collaboration here. So um, with that. Just to recap, the $65,000 by statute will be released through um, Derek, correct, Karen? Are you all set? Right. I think the next step, Alex, if you could just after the meeting, uh, send an email to Derek confirming that this is all set to go. The commission had voted on the prior occasion on their statutory obligations on the designation. So we're good to go to release the money. Yeah, so sounds good. Perfect. Good. Thank so you. we're all set administratively. Um, again, counsel, Counselor Coleman, thank you so much. And Dr. Lightbound, thank you. Glad that we've, we've, we've um, been able to, to take care of that piece of work. Thank you so much for this. I know that these jockeys would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, then moving on to item number seven. Um, Executive Director Wells, you've got an update for us. Yes. So uh, as the commission is aware, we've had conversations. We've had an uh, ongoing aud internal audit com and compliance working group. Uh, we discussed at one of the last uh, meetings that it would be a good idea to do a quarterly update for the, at the full commission on what's been going on uh, at those meetings and the sort of the objectives uh, for the year ahead. So at the beginning of this uh, calendar year, I did identify uh, objectives for this group for the different quarters. So I'm breaking this um, calendar into quarters. And for Q1, uh, the objective at the beginning of the quarter was to compile a risk matrix and initiate the casino audit review. So those uh, objectives have been uh, worked on this quarter. We had meetings in January, February, and March. Uh, and working on those, um, the casino audit review uh, has been done. Uh, for the last uh, calendar year. And uh, for as far as the uh, activities at the internal audit and compliance group, uh, first of all, we did the review and evaluation of the CY 2020 risk matrix, so last year. So the whole group got to have some input on what those items were and some feedback for updates and changes. Uh, so that team input is helpful. Uh, I will note it's a lot to do in that larger group setting and um, Derek and Enrique did advise that the last time they had to finalize it individually. So I'm learning, I'm gonna need to have a smaller group to finalize that, just to put that in the right format, uh, finalize it and do any last minute edits. That will be part of the internal control plan uh, that we're required to do. Uh, so that's as part of the, um, Q2 activities will be doing the internal control plan and will attach that risk matrix. Uh, the other thing we did is that we did a review of the 2019 casino audit findings and management letters. So those are the uh, E-Bailey audits that are done uh, through that team and some support by our financial investigations division and our finance division. So those have been uh, completed and finalized and I have signed off on those. And then the other thing that we've been doing, which I think is, is new and been really interesting and, and helpful, is we're working on uh, this internal program on our internal compliance calendars. 
So the finance division led by our CFO, uh, Derek Lennon, uh, his methodology, which he's used, is over time building a compliance calendar for his, in, his group internally. So these are things that his team is required to do, and it's a mechanism to check that internally we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, Derek led a presentation to the uh, Internal Audit and Compliance Working Group on how they do their calendar, how it developed, and that, and that process. That was very well received, and then uh, CFO Lennon also got the rest of the division heads together so they could um, participate in that program as well. So uh, they did that in January, and then you know, building that system to check that we are accountable for doing what we're supposed to be doing, that may look different from division to division. You know, it's a little easier in the finance group, different groups, it's potentially going to look different. So um, we had um, the IEB head, the Financial Investigations Division. You saw Monica earlier today, and uh, Paul Eldridge helped with that. He is on the, he is in that working group as was, as was Monica. So they came in in March and did sort of a presentation. It was more focused on their risk analysis, which is the basis for this uh, compliance calendar look. So what are the risks? What are we doing to make sure that we are accountable for what we're supposed to be doing? So uh, the plan is we'll go through the different divisions uh, through the calendar year and teams will be able to come in and take a, you know, uh, present what their thoughts are and how they uh, account for their compliance, their own inter internal compliance. And then this group is, you know, it's a, it's a comfort zone. It's a safety zone where you can come and talk about it, no judgment, just let's talk about ways to make sure that you're tracking what you're supposed to be tracking in your individual divisions. And the approach is one of support and help and team thinking and collaboration on those. So the next one up in April is uh, Joe Delaney's going to bring in uh, information from the Community Affairs Division, and we'll take a look at that. So that's you know just a general update on what we've been doing. Uh, next quarter, you will be looking at uh, aside from these ongoing compliance calendar reviews, we'll be looking at finalization of the ICP and the ICQ, and then looking at the uh, Casino Audit Review for 2020. So those are some of the activities I am most uh, interested in um, just feedback from any commissioner. I know I, uh, Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga obviously have more of an understanding because they're part of this team, but for the chair and for Commissioner Cameron, I'm definitely open to any ideas or any suggestions as we build a sort of a robust internal compliance plan for the team. So uh, that's just a snapshot of where we are. I thought it would be helpful every quarter to just give you an update and you can see the cadence of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I'm available for questions and also if Commissioner Zuniga or Commissioner O'Brien want to comment on, on what we're doing or their thoughts or their, um, you know, their direction for what we're doing going forward. I'm, I'm definitely interested in that as well. Questions for, for Karen? Oh, come on, compliance guys, you've got to have questions. Uh, well, I know that Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga are part of the working group, so they are well versed in it. So Commissioner O'Brien, I know how uh, you're, you're nodding your head. Commissioner Cameron, uh, you're probably quite satisfied and, and also love the approach um, as I do. Yeah, very organized, structured, um, inclusive approach. So I have no questions and just Excellent work, thank you. Yeah, and I think it's really important as you described to make sure everybody feels, you know, that they, this is the, the spot where they can feel safe and discuss the, the challenges of compliance and, and assess risk. Um, you know, I think one, one thing I just would continue to reiterate, no one should be ever afraid to raise a concern if they need more resources or they can't tackle something, and, you know, open, open dialogue, that's as a team, no judgment, as you say, Karen, I thought that was an excellent point. Um, the only thing on the uh, ICP and ICQ, I think those are June deadlines? Yeah, so those are due at the end of June. So the plan is to do the initial review at the uh, April meeting, um, and then uh, another review before the end of June. And uh, Derek Lennon and I will be working on that independently as well, probably with some assistance from Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner O'Brien, just so we have some. Yeah. 
So, yeah, and in the past I had, I had reviewed um, in advance, I really think a great practice is to, to get um, the close to final draft right. out and distribute it in advance to every, every you know, the key, your key um, managers and directors and, and I would think our fellow commissioners. So yeah. if that's possible in your timeline, that would be great. Just yeah. in case, you know, something's amiss. Um, so, but I think this is, I, I really appreciate the update in your, and in, in your giving the entire team um, kind of an understanding of, of, of um, the process and the work you're doing. So thanks. And I appreciate being part of the, the queue. So thanks. Moving on now to our next item is the commissioner's update. It could be a standalone, um, real high level. First, I want to um, explain that in the packet, uh, we do have Miller and Chevalier's um, uh, work plan for phase three of the independent co uh, uh, compliance monitors work, Alejandro Montenegro Amante. Uh, the document does say it may contain sensitive information not subject to public disclosure. I can assure everyone that we received affirmative um, guidance from the independent monitor saying that this, in fact, was proper to be released and unredacted. So you'll see no redactions. Um, uh, this is a high-level work plan. We had asked uh, Commissioner O'Brien and I um, really have only met a you know, occasionally uh, right before um, <clears throat> the uh, monitor is expected to give an update to the commission on a whole, just to give that team guidance about working with a public body like ours. Um, we met with uh, General Counsel Grossman um, with uh, the independent uh, monitor to just talk about the plan for the next year and um, she agreed to give a high level plan on this particular phase. Uh, and that, as you'll see, um, and does have uh, the approach laid out in the document that's a part of our packet that they would continue to expect to receive documents from the, the company. They'll continue to review the appropriate and relevant documents. They'll continue to review the company's implementation of the uh, extensive recommendations that you've seen in the past, um, many of which the company's meeting and some which, uh, because of COVID, they still had some work to do. And then there were some new recommendations. And then third, they'll continue to um, evaluate or update matters that uh, relate to the um, HR compliance plan, including the uh, um, areas that you saw in the baseline assessment plan. And then in the document, um, the fourth part of the plan does highlight um, continued work more on the interview side and testing side. Um, it's a high level plan that, that she um, has come up with. And of course, at the end, there'll be any additional recommendations that the um, monitor thinks are necessary to really achieve what was part of our decision back uh, in, um, in April of, of 2019. Uh, our approach has been that we would not um, interfere with the judgment of the independent monitor, that it's important to be deferential to the plan. With that said, we do monitor the bills and invoices and, um, and, and we, we keep track of that. But the thought would be with respect to this piece, and then I'll turn it over to Commissioner O'Brien on the schedule that, um, you know, we wouldn't seek any kind of a formal approval, uh, but that this does, I did confirm with uh, Councillor Grossman that this does align with the original contract that, that we entered into with the um, independent monitor. So before, um, I just want to check in with Todd at the end to make sure that I'm not missing something, but Commissioner O'Brien, if you'd like to go over the schedule or add anything that um, you think should be highlighted on the, the plan itself. No, I mean, I think if you look at what's set out for the tentative schedule, it's pretty um, self-explanatory. Um, if you go into some of the details and what they expect to do, it, there's a little bit of more board heavy focus in terms of questions and process and onboarding in that thing, which is something if you go back and look, they haven't done the deeper dive they said they were gonna do on yet. So that makes sense. It's all consistent with the initial uh, work plan. So 
the expectation obviously being that we would get an interim report um, at the end of the summer and then sort of the final submission of something um, more comprehensive and final um, at the first of the year in 2022. Right, but that deeper, deeper dive, um, we thought it might be helpful to have the interim be a little bit of a higher level, right? Um, uh, more of a PowerPoint rather than a full blown report. Right. So that's the schedule you'll see. Um, this uh, process is underway already as of February and then a January date. So we'll want to uh, think about for September, start putting that into our agenda setting. Um, Councillor Todd, do you have anything you want to add that we may have skipped over or missed? Not at all. I think you've covered it well, I, and I think this is all unfolding as contemplated um, in the RFR and contract process. Questions, comments? All set. And if you do have any questions or comments, you know, obviously um, I'm available, uh, but Todd's also available. We, um, we do, whenever there's an invoice, the process is I do check in. With Commissioner O'Brien to see if she has any concerns and Todd and then Derek and his team process those the reimbursement from the company okay or direct payment now I think actually okay all right then um, that's the first of Commissioner updates do we have any other Commissioner updates Commissioner Cameron. Madam Chair, I don't have an update, but I would just love to give a shout out to the gaming agents in their newsletter, um, which was forwarded to us yesterday. I really enjoyed reading about the first woman to serve as CEO of a casino. So I, I give them credit for doing that research and getting that out in honor of Women's History Month. So just a shout out. Good work. Yeah. Great read, wasn't it? Excellent. Yeah, um, and, and, and just also a nice follow up from uh, Town Hall where we had the two very experienced gaming agents give such a great presentation in light of um, their role as, as, as they, wouldn't, they were careful, they were not as self complimentary as I would have thought they would be because they didn't necessarily view themselves as pioneers, but I think we can safely say they, well, they are pioneers in the gaming, the gaming world and um, collectively brought together, I think, about 50 years of experience, so uh, very, very nice, uh, nicely done. Commissioner Zuniga, do you have any update that you want to provide? Uh, not, not an update, but uh, perhaps um, a comment. During, uh, since our last meeting, um, I know the staff forwarded a letter to uh, Senator Lesser's office relative to the bill that was um, drafted that they have out there. Um, I would welcome in the future the opportunity to view, review a draft and provide feedback as, uh, as I know we've done in the past, for example, with the annual report. Um, I, think it, I think I should say first, by the way, that uh, it's great. It's a great uh, letter. It's a great document that, that outlines a lot of the stuff that's included in the Gaming Act relative to some of the areas where the bill, that bill could be uh, strengthened. But, um, but again, I, I would think that um, it, it would be a good practice to have um, all of us come in and, and, and have a high level um, view of the, of the final draft before we, it went out. Um, and I hope that we could do that in the, in the future. Thank you. Any other um, commissioner updates? Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. So, barring any other comments, then we just would have to have a, um, a, a motion to adjourn on this beautiful day. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Sorry, I have a, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. All right, um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Great meeting today. We covered a lot of areas. Um, appreciate everybody's input. 4-0, Vivian, thank you for your work. Thank you, Councillor Grossman, for all of your work. And thank you, Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.